Great. All right. Great. Uh, well, welcome everyone to today's Ballot Day Rally. Uh, very thrilled to see all of you here uh, and people still trickling in. So fantastic uh, that we have people tuned in all around the world. Uh, my name is Candace Karastan, and it's my honor to serve as Democrats Abroad's international chair. And what that means concretely is that I get to work with fantastic teams on the ground around the world to make sure that we are reaching US citizens and dual citizens and getting them to vote. Uh, at the core of our mission is mobilizing that overseas vote and also advocating for Americans uh, who are living overseas back home in the United States in Washington and in state capitals around the country. So, so thrilled uh, to be here with you on ballot day. Uh, and as you may have seen in some of our communications uh, earlier, we, we took a little closer look at what exactly ballot day is. Uh, and today marks 45 days before the November 8th midterm elections. And it's also the day that under federal law, the MOVE Act, uh, that local election offices are required to send out overseas absentee ballots to every overseas voter who requested one in 2022. So if you requested your ballot already this year, uh, check your inboxes. If you requested to receive it by email, check your mailbox. Uh, if you requested it by postal mail. I live in Norway and vote in Maryland, okay. Great. Uh, Maryland voter, important governor's race there. Uh, get your ballot um, and make sure that you vote it and again, Pay attention to all of those races that we're going to hear from the candidates today at the state and local level. So many important issues being decided there. So if you get the full ballot, make sure that you're voting for every single candidate that you can, and every single candidate who's a Democrat who's going to take our country forward. So please fill out your ballot, return it right away. Uh, I'm a Pennsylvania voter myself. Pennsylvania requires that we send our ballots back by postal mail. So that means that I am getting my postal, uh, my ballot to mail box as soon as possible when we get off this call. Uh, and I'll be voting from abroad very early. Uh, don't delay, get your ballot back. And we might be asking ourselves, why is this important? And I think that generally, right, we, we know how much is at stake, but I think it's important to put that in perspective with our constituency as overseas voters. Uh, in 2020, the votes from abroad were the margin of victory for President Biden and Vice President Harris in not only Arizona, but in Georgia. So if overseas voters had not shown up like they did, we would be looking at a very, very different landscape in the United States. And to be clear, this isn't just about winning elections. This isn't about winning Arizona or winning Georgia. This is about what the president and vice president and our Congress have been able to do because we did win Georgia. Just a few weeks ago, under President Biden's leadership, we signed the most historic and largest investment in climate change mitigation that the United States has ever done. We've prioritized infrastructure, gun safety, action on climate change, action on affordable healthcare and prescription drug prices. And all of this is possible because overseas voters showed up in 2020, as did our friends back home, and that's why we're here today, to make sure that we continue to get out the vote from overseas and that we allow this change that we so desperately want to see in our country happen under democratic leadership. So in this vein, uh, very thrilled to have so many fantastic candidates uh, joining us on today's call. Hopefully you'll be able to get a flavor uh, of all of the different races happening around the country. We're going to start off with Indiana. Uh, and hop really all around from California to Florida to Pennsylvania to Wisconsin. Uh, and here again from candidates who are running in very tight races uh, that are gonna determine again, if we have majorities uh, in Washington, if we win majorities in state legislatures and governorships and all of these important offices that are really critical for not just 2022, but for 2024. So in that vein, I just wanted to thank all of our event organizers for uh, putting today's call together. Uh, there's been a lot of behind the scenes <laughs> work that has gone into this. Uh, so a huge thank you to every single person who made this event possible. And I did just wanna extend my gratitude to all of our teams throughout Democrats Abroad. We have people working in so many different departments from voter assistance. Uh, if you have a voter question, for example, you can vote to, you can write to info at democratsabroad.org 
And we have a team who's monitoring that inbox around the clock to make sure that people uh, can vote from abroad. We have people working on events, phone banking, battleground state voters. Uh, there are so many different ways to plug in. And we are all volunteers who are doing this important work because we know, again, that it matters. Uh, that it's not just going to win elections this November, but that it's going to allow our country to move in the direction that it needs to. One last thing in this vein of all being uh, volunteers and doing this important work is I encourage you to really think of your attendance today as the start of your engagement with Democrats Abroad. We have a lot of work to do in these next 45 days. Uh, we have thousands of battleground state voters, swing congressional district voters, who we need to reach. Uh, we have extensive phone banking campaigns running to all of those voters. I would really encourage you to plug in to our efforts. Again, now is the time to win over voters uh, and get out the votes so that we are waking up on November 9th uh, with Democratic majorities. Uh, let's go for a 2020 election morning and not a 2016 election morning. The good news is, is that is in our hands right now. So please plug into what's going on with Democrats Abroad, all of our great volunteer opportunities. I know we're gonna talk about those uh, in more detail later on. Just a few links for you, uh, democratsabroad.org slash phone banking. We're calling uh, fellow Democrats who are living abroad and simply reminding them to request and return their ballot. Uh, so that's a very friendly audience who is very grateful uh, for your call. And again, we have thousands of people who we are trying to reach, some of whom we have already reached, but the list continues to grow. We're excited about that, but we need your help. Uh, so if you can jump on the phones with us for even 15 minutes uh, a day, 15 minutes a week, every little bit that we do will add up. So democratsabroad.org slash phone banking. And lastly, I did wanna encourage you to become a donor to Democrats Abroad. Uh, no other part of the Democratic Party is doing the work that Democrats Abroad is doing. No other campaign is doing the work that Democrats Abroad is doing to mobilize the overseas vote. So when we talk about being the margin of victory in Arizona, in Georgia, uh, and getting more voters to the polls, or in this case, to return their ballots, uh, that is coming from the people who you see on today's call, uh, from your local Democrats Abroad leadership in your country. Uh, so we rely on your generosity, your donations, your volunteerism, again, to make sure that we keep delivering for the Democratic Party and for the issues that matter to us. So very grateful, again, for your attendance on today's call. Um, looking forward to your continued engagement with our organization uh, and very excited for today's event. Uh, so without further ado, we will dive right in. Uh, we're going to get started with Indiana. And I'm going to toss over to uh, Nikki Vonderbell, one of our Democrat Club leaders in Germany. Nikki. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are today. I am super excited to introduce our first speaker for today. Um, not only is Tom McDermott joining us from a very busy US Senate campaign trail, he also is joining us even though his daughter is getting married later today. So that is super exciting and very um, amazing. So uh, Tom McDermott, just so you know a little bit about him before he speaks, is the 20th mayor of Hamden, Indiana, which is the eighth largest city. Uh, he has numerous awards. He served in the Navy. Uh, he's been 18, uh, he's spent at least 18 years as mayor, and he's brought in over a billion dollars in economic development to the city. He's helped fund thousands of students' higher education uh, dreams with a college bound scholarship program. I mean, this is definitely a, a man of the people who is fighting for the people. And uh, with that, Mayor McDermott, I'm going to let you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself. his staffer is on is that where we're going to um tom has told me that he is on so i am curious to know if he is in that internet ether somewhere <laughs> 
yes, he is on. I am not sure if, if folks can't hear him or if he is muted. I'll double check. Do you know what, is he signed in under his own name? Should be, yes, ma'am. I don't see him. Oh, it looks like he's muted. I'm sorry. And he's unable to unmute himself. I apologize. Um, if we could find him, where is, is he under his own name? Yes, ma'am. Just one second, so sorry about this. Okay, really quickly while they're getting that sorted out, um, a couple interesting things about Indiana voting that I am personally very jealous about is you can have your ballot delivered to you via email and you can also send your ballot back via email, fax or by postal mail. Um, I know if I had the choice to be able to send my ballot back via email, I would be super grateful. Um, also, we'll have a couple links for you, both for uh, Mayor McDermott's campaign, but also for the rest of the Indiana party ticket and an Indiana voter guide that you can refer to for the rest of your down ballot candidates, which are also equally important to vote for. All right. He should be able to unmute himself now. Go ahead, Mr. McDermott. All right. I'm in. Hi, everybody. <laughs> that was. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we got you. All right. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you're from. I'm Tom McDermott. I'm the mayor of the city of Hammond, and I'm uh, in my fifth term uh, as mayor. I've been reelected five times. Uh, it was a Republican city when I took over, and I've been mayor for 19 years now. Uh, obviously, taking my game to a higher level, running for United States Senate against Todd Young, who has been in Washington, D.C. for 12 years. And if you listen to what Senator Young has to say, all America's problems are the fault of President Biden, and he shares no responsibility whatsoever for inflation, price of gas, anything going on right now, which is very disingenuous. But I was once a Democrat abroad myself. I was uh, in the United States Navy, uh, participated in a couple elections while I was overseas, so I, I appreciate what you're all doing. Uh, when I was in the Navy, I was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, but we spent I was on the submarine for over four years and we spent plenty of time overseas where the only way we can participate in elections is doing what you're all doing. So thank you very much for what you're doing. Um, not sure when many of you, the last time you've been over here in the mainland, but I can tell you that uh, ever since the Dobbs opinion leaked, uh, when the, and then the US Supreme Court followed it up with uh, Rose overturning, um, America has been, the Democratic Party, in my opinion, has been on, plant has been on fire um oh, you know sure. women so we're not gonna watch kira we'll watch kira outside hello uh women have been powering my campaign women have been powering the democratic party uh this is the year of the woman uh and and i'm very proud in indiana to be on a campaign ticket with all women and myself uh i have a, a secretary of state candidate that's a, a, a veteran herself uh destiny scott wells and we have two amazing women running for treasurer and auditor, which I think is, you know, I, our state chairman did a great job putting this ticket together. But I, I think Todd Young is definitely on the run. Uh, it's a race that a year ago, not a lot of people thought we'd have much of a chance in. And here we are a year later with the power that women are, are bringing to the Democratic Party right now. I think that we have a real good chance. I did a poll about three weeks ago of 2,100 voters in Indiana. And it showed at that time, I was only three points down to Todd Young. Uh, he had 45% of the vote. I had 42% of the vote. And I've never been so happy to be losing by three points in my life, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the thing is that poll gave Democrats in Indiana uh, life, basically, that this race is competitive. We have a candidate that could actually beat Todd Young and, and start winning seats here in Indiana again. You know, and I know a lot of people consider Indiana a very red state, but when I first got involved in politics, Democrats routinely won in the state of Indiana. Uh, when I was elected, we had a Democratic governor, we had a Democratic senator, a Democratic House of Representatives. So it's not like it's impossible to win as a Democrat in Indiana. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to be running. Uh, I appreciate what you all do for our party. Uh, and as the speaker indicated earlier in 2020, Democrat abroad votes were vitally important to helping President Biden become the president of the United States. And I think that Democratic broad, uh, votes uh, are gonna be very important in my race as well. Um, 
So uh, anyway, like I said, you know, things are going really well out here. I think we're on the right side of history. Our party is on the right side of history. We're on the right side with women. And I anticipate much like happened in Kansas, much like happened in Alaska, much like happened in the special election in New York, I think in Indiana on November 8th, 2022, women and first time voters are gonna show up in mass and, and elect democratic candidates up and down the board. And I've already promised the Hoosier women that once I'm elected, I'm. I'm going to go in there and fight like crazy to codify Roe versus Wade, uh, to codify Obergefell as well, because same sex marriage is, I'm sure, then, you know, the next target for the GOP. And I'm just very proud to uh, to be the standard bearer for our party in Indiana right now. I'm looking forward to firing Todd Young on November 8th and becoming your U.S. Senator and working hard to restore the image of the United States Senate. So I want to thank everybody for putting this call together and seeing hundreds of people in the morning. It's eight o'clock in the morning where I am. So I'm drinking my coffee. I know some people across the world right now are probably having cocktails, but uh, I just woke up and it is my daughter's wedding day, but I did want to knock out this very important meeting before I got started. So thank you all very much for what you do. If you want to donate to my campaign, my name is Thomas McDermott, M-C-D-E-R-M-O-T-T. -T. Um, I would appreciate donates, donations through Act Blue. Uh, I'm making Todd Young work his tail off and I plan to beat him on November 8th. So I appreciate being invited to this. I appreciate what you all do for the party and it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much, Mc Mayor McDermott, for being here, especially on the day your daughter is getting married. So I hope you have no a problem. wonderful, wonderful day. And um, thank you again for being here and also Lindsay for your help. Thank you. Okay, thank we're you guys. gonna go ahead and now move it over to the state of Michigan. A little ironic me being from Ohio, handing it over to Michigan, but I'll, I'll go for it this one time. Um, so Anne-Marie Bissett, if you're ready. Thank you so much, I'm here. Um, so today, uh, briefly about the Michigan voting information, we have numerous high uh, Anne -Marie, profile- Can we go straight to Governor, to um, Lieutenant Governor oh, Absolutely. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. He was a community problem solver early on setting up a computer lab in a Detroit community center with computers he built himself at age 16. A University of Michigan graduate in computer science and engineering, he helped build Microsoft SharePoint and then turned to social entrepreneurship, helping communities around the country organize economically and politically. In 2014, Gilchrist returned to Detroit and entered local government as Director of Innovation and Emerging Technology, Improving Government Responsiveness and Accountability. And as Lieutenant Governor since 2019, he is also focused on addressing inequity and injustice. One example is co-leading the Jail and Pretrial Incarceration Task Force. His toolbox includes science, fact-based practices, and connecting individuals statewide. It's my pleasure now uh, to have you here with us, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilquist. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. I am Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilquist of the great state of Michigan, and I'm so proud to be joining all of you Democrats abroad and to be sharing this platform with so many amazing candidates from all across the country. Uh, this morning, or I'm, I'm saying morning because it's morning here in Detroit. Today represents the, you can see the entire breadth of the strength of our movement. And I am so elated to be on the same ballot in the same year with so many amazing people I caught the tail end of Mayor McDermott's uh, talk, and I am so excited for him to be a United States Senator. And um, so I hope that everyone is eager to support all the candidates that you're hearing from today. I have the pleasure and privilege of serving in the state of Michigan alongside Gretchen Whitmer, our amazing uh, governor here in the state of Michigan. And alongside us on the ballot, we have uh, candidates up and down the ticket who are not only protectors and expanders of access to democracy, protectors and expanders of access to abortion care and full reproductive uh, services and health care for all uh, women and everyone who's capable of being pregnant in the state of Michigan. But we really see ourselves as those who can create a platform for opportunity and inclusion and a future that has a place for everyone in Michigan. We have an amazing Secretary of State candidate, Jocelyn Benson, and extraordinary Attorney General candidate, and Dana Nessel, who we are looking to all send our 
Democratic executive team that was elected in the Queen sweep in 2018, uh, uh, back in the office here in 2022. But I want to share that in Michigan, we have a unique opportunity and this sort of highest leverage moment uh, really in two generations of electoral politics in Michigan. An opportunity, sure, buddy. I'm gonna say hi to my son, his birthday's tomorrow. Hi, buddy. That's my son. Hi, right, this is Garland the third. Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, in Michigan, we have a chance this year to not only codify the protections for abortion care uh, in our state constitution, we have a chance to extend a Supreme Court majority at the state level by electing our first black woman to the Michigan Supreme Court in Kyra Harris Bolden. And we have a chance to flip the Michigan legislature. The Michigan State Senate has been in Republican hands for the last 40 years. Now for context, I turn 40 tomorrow and my entire life, I've only known Senate Republican failure in our state Senate. But we have a chance to flip that chamber and to flip uh, our state house for the first time in almost a decade and having democratic majorities alongside Governor Whitmer and I give us a chance to make progress on legislation that we've only dreamed about for the last 30 years. We can make meaningful progress in continuing to strengthen our state's response to climate change. We can make meaningful progress in delivering gun violence prevention legislation that helps folks in inner cities and helps keep schools safe. We can deliver uh, double down on our investments in education, improving pay for teachers, we can invest in our infrastructure in ways we've never seen before, having Michigan be the first state to connect all of our people online, the first big state we do that uh, in the country. And we're super eager for that ambition. And that project is one of my babies. Uh, we have amazing members of our congressional delegation. The path to maintaining our House majority runs through Michigan. And I'm talking about the races to keep Alyssa Slotkin in Congress, to keep Dan Kildee in Congress and to extend and flip seats in Michigan like Hillary Skolton in Michigan's third district and an exciting one, um, a man named Carl Marlinga running in Michigan's 10th district. We can flip these seats. We can make sure that the chamber stays in democratic hands and then working in conjunction with our president and vice president in alignment with our state government, we can make progress on issues that we are dreaming about making progress. And frankly, it's why I got into public service. I didn't get in to stop bad things from happening only from Republicans. I'm an engineer by training. I'm a software developer. I like to make things and make things happen and make systems work for people. And that is our opportunity this year. It's a generational one. And I thank all of you for being willing to invest in, to support, and to really step up and play your role because we all have a role to play in ensuring that our democracy is protected, that our human, civil, and healthcare rights are protected, and that all of us are creating the conditions for more people and the people who are here with us and will come later after us to be successful and be their best selves and realize their full potential. So Governor Whitmer and I absolutely appreciate your support. The Michigan Democratic Party appreciates your support. And when we win in Michigan, it is a true demonstration that our values can carry the day all across America. So thank you for being part of this. And as I like to say, standing tall for the great state of Michigan. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. Really appreciate your time and those words. They're inspiring to us all. And uh, just to note again, on uh, to follow up with the voting, the Supreme Court B and B, Bernstein and Bolden, and the three proposals on financial disclosure, election reform, and reproductive freedom are on the ballot, uh, along with all of these key races. So um, a reminder that you can get your ballot via email, but everything has to be mailed back in, postal mail. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen Lee, uh, working with us today on Ohio. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's my honor today to introduce our guest, our senatorial candidate, who unfortunately is not able to be with us. He's been on extended sick leave all this week. Um, so what I'm going to say is very briefly about Tim Ryan. Tim has represented the 13th Ohio Congressional District ever since it was the 17th in 2003. They've gerrymandered it twice to try to get rid of him, but it just doesn't seem to work. An independent thinker, Ryan has been a reliable voice for his constituents and a solid supporter of the Democratic platform, though not a slave to it. He occasionally disagrees and lets the leadership know why. When he's not in Washington, though, he lives just down the road from the house that he grew up in, in Niles, Ohio, 
those of you who know Ohio know it's in the northeast quadrant of the state up there where we've talked about the Rust Belt. That area is struggling to recover. And with those Ohio roots, and particularly in that area, Tim brings a passionate support of working families to the table. And that translates to revitalizing American manufacturing and the fair wage union jobs it will bring to Ohio as well. And you can read details about Tim and his program on his website. I think they're going to put that in the chat. I would like to add very quickly also, um, because I've been listening to our first two speakers, Mr. McDermott and Mr. Gilchrist. Ohio also has a really stellar slate of candidates statewide, our executive branch, Nan Whaley, our, um, our candidates for AG and Secretary of State and Auditor and Treasurer. We've heard them all. Also our three Supreme Court justices, uh, two are running to be justice and Jen Brunner running to be Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court and more. We just had our 13 of our 15 congressional candidates last Sunday in a webinar and all of those are available on the YouTube channel, which I hope they will also be able to put in. But if not, you can find it on the Ohio landing page on the Democrats Abroad website. With that, I am going to leave it to my colleague, um, Ohio team co-lead Nikki Vondervel, and our other co-lead is working tech today, Angela Fobbs. But Nikki is here on screen, and she's going to give you some more information about Ohio voting. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a couple of reminders from the great state of Ohio, OH. And I'm just going to pretend I heard a crap ton of IOs out there. Sorry, IO. IO, I'm you. muted. <laughs> um, we do have Senator Tim Ryan running in the state of Ohio, along with a ton of other amazing Democratic candidates, governor, lieutenant governor, those seats are all up this year. So it's incredibly important that you request your ballot and vote. Um, we've listed the deadlines there, and I've also dropped the link for the Ohio Voter Guide. Oh, thanks for the IOs in the chat, everyone. Um, but a couple of just really important state-specific things to remember. Um, you can request your ballot. You should request your ballot be sent to you via email at this point. It's the quickest way to get it. Check your spam folder. Check your junk folders. Um, for those of you that already requested your ballot, you should have started receiving them yesterday. You have to receive, you have to send your ballot back though via postal mail. Vote it, get it back in the mail now, because as we know, no matter where you live in the world, um, mail has become uh, a little bit more unreliable. Also, be sure to sign your ballot where instructed. Um, we do have some links on the Ohio Voter Guide that explain this a little bit more thoroughly. And also, um, again, you can check back there. We will also have a video for how to put together your ballot. Um, how to pack it up and how to drop it in the mail for those of you that are more visual learners like I am. So with that, thank you very much. Another OHIO, just because I love it. And I will hand it over to Portia Commons. Portia, you need to unmute. Uh, okay, I'll start again. <laughs> I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today and very, very happy to introduce our first candidate from Pennsylvania, who is um, current, our current Lieutenant Governor, John Fetterman. John is running to flip a Pennsylvania State, uh, Pennsylvania Senate seat uh, in one of the most competitive and widely watched races this year. A Pennsylvania native, John was born in York to teenage parents just starting out on their own. He later served in AmeriCorps and as mayor of Braddock, one of the poorest and most challenged communities in Pennsylvania. Um, during his time as mayor, John worked to rebuild his community, to create jobs, to engage young citizens, and to deliver creative urban policy solutions. First as mayor and now as Lieutenant Governor, John has been on the forefront of progress, pushing for marijuana legalization before it was popular, officiating same-sex marriage before it was legal, and advocating for universal health coverage long before it was mainstream. He's now running for US Senate to keep fighting for forgotten places and working people across Pennsylvania. 
like he has his whole career. The Lieutenant Governor has a message for all of us from his hometown in Braddock. Hey, Dems abroad. It's John Fetterman. I'm running for the US Senate here in Pennsylvania. I'm speaking to you today right here in Braddock, Pennsylvania. As soon as you receive your ballot in the mail, I urge you to return it just as soon as possible. Control of the Senate all comes down to PA. Every vote counts, including your vote from abroad. Thank you so much for making your voices heard. As we just heard from the Lieutenant Governor, the most important thing about voting in Pennsylvania is to get your ballots back as soon as possible. Ballots returned up to seven days after election day will be counted if they are postmarked no later than the day before election day, the 7th of November. All Pennsylvania ballots must be returned by regular postal mail, private courier or diplomatic post. They can't be emailed back. There are many critical elections on the ballot for Pennsylvania this year, including the Senate race, multiple House battleground districts, and a governor's race where Democrat Josh Shapiro is running to keep an extremely anti-choice, election-denying Republican candidate out of office. You have until October 24th to register to vote in Pennsylvania, but if you have not already sent in your FPCA, then please don't wait to do so. The eyes of the country will be on Pennsylvania come election day, so don't miss out on your chance to have a say in these monumentally important elections. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ashley Ehas. Are we ready for that? Can I go ahead with that? Great. Ashley is a US Army veteran that rose from a challenging upbringing to become a West Point graduate and the only woman in her Apache helicopter class. She served multiple overseas tours of duty and later used her GI Bill to get her master's from the University of Oxford. During the pandemic, she worked as a policy writer and a project coordinator to implement the CARES Act for county government. She is now a government and public sector consultant. Ashley is running to flip Pennsylvania's highly competitive first district and beat a Republican incumbent who voted against the Women's Health Pr Protection Act, against climate action in the Inflation Reduction Act, and against voting rights protections. Ashley has sent us a message from Bucks in Montgomery counties in Pennsylvania. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Ashley Ehas, and I'm running for Congress here in Pennsylvania's first district, which is a district that President Biden carried by five points in 2020, and I'm running to unseat an anti-choice Republican in what is an overwhelmingly pro-choice district. And I myself am a political newcomer. I spent most of my adult life in the service. I graduated from West Point and then became an attack helicopter pilot. I was also a commander for a number of years. So I had the real privilege of leading soldiers overseas and here at home. But I also understand the challenges of trying to get your vote in from overseas. So I'm really grateful for this community here. And I know I don't need to tell everyone on this call what's at stake this year. Choice is absolutely on the ballot. And I'll be honest, as a veteran who served overseas to protect our freedoms, to have my own taken away from me here at home, this doesn't sit right with me. So we're taking the fight to them. So everyone who's on the call, thank you so much for all the hard work you've already put in. I know there's a lot more to come, whether it be phone banking or writing postcards. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really great stuff and it helps make sure voters are informed. And I just want to say, if you requested your ballot, you should have gotten it by today. And I encourage you to please turn that in as soon as possible. And if you haven't gotten it yet, go to votefromabroad.org and put your request in. We know that if we don't hold on to the Senate and the House this year, the Republicans are coming for everything we hold dear. And so this group here is incredibly important to making sure, like we said, we take the fight to them and make sure we hold on to Congress so that way we can codify our fundamental rights. So keep up the great work and keep an eye on our race here. It's ehasforcongress.com, E-H-A-S-Z, forcongress.com. 
and I'm so excited to work with you, and I can't wait to see what we do together. Thanks again, everybody. Um, I just also finally wanted to add very quickly that um, I read a statistic that only 2% of uh, Americans eligible to vote from overseas return their ballots for the midterms. And I really hope that this year we can blast through that number and make a, make a, make a real difference um, in, this, in these important midterms. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Portia. All right. Really appreciate all of our teams for their work on this event. And thank you to our Pennsylvanians Abroad State team for those amazing videos and for connecting us with these phenomenal candidates. I am Jennifer von Estor from our Democrats Abroad Global State Teams Coordinator, and I'm the team lead of Texans Abroad. We are so excited that you could join us today for our ballot day rally. And we wanna just get rally behind these phenomenal candidates in crucial races and start off our election season here at Democrats Abroad. Your votes from abroad are going to be essential in races up and down the ballot this year. Um, we'd love to see in our poll where you're at in the voting process. I believe if you wanna turn that poll on, <laughs> there is so much on the, on the line this year um, and this is really the most important election of our lifetimes. And it's never been more important that every single Democrat at home and abroad cast their ballot this year. We want to encourage you to help turn out the vote from abroad and not only to cast your own ballots, but to help others cast their ballots. So in order to do that, we've got something kind of fun. It is our six degrees of action campaign. I think you might understand why we've named it that. And not only will you get the help satisfaction of helping to deliver key victories across the country, you will be eligible for two phenomenal prizes, which we'll talk more about in a second. It's all hands on deck to preserve the future of your state and of our country. First off, start by requesting, voting, and returning your ballots as soon as possible. That will already get you six points in our prize draw, which means six entries. And though that's a great start, there is so much more that you can do. You can reach out to anyone and everyone you know living abroad and make sure that they have a plan to vote. In fact, you can use the time that you're on this call to start making a list of people to contact and then go ahead and reach out to them and let them know that they need to request their ballots every calendar year at votefromabroad.org. We're gonna give you more ways to take action throughout the event but we just want you to go ahead and get started thinking of how you can help to get out the overseas vote. And with that, we could go to the results of our survey. We can go do that. We can do that later on as well. If you haven't filled out our survey, just give that a go. And we wanna know who all has had a chance to vote and who's got their ballots. I'm gonna hand over to Inga from our Californians Abroad team. Good to go now, Inga. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I'm Inga Kemtrup. I am a member of the California State uh, team, and I'm trying to click on things here to tell you that a lot of people have the wrong idea about California, thinking that it is a completely blue democratic state, but that's not the real picture. The state actually has plenty of congressional swing districts and keeping or flipping those swing states in November may make the big difference uh, to holding the House for the Democrats. And I have to do a little plug and I have one of my colleagues on the state team will put in the URL to a special event we have on October 8th about California swings, which will also feature the semi-legendary Katie Porter. Now, as a California voter, I'm really delighted to introduce one of those swing district candidates, Mike Levin, who is running in District 49. Mike was raised in Orange County by a Mexican-American mother and Jewish-American father. He is the grandson of Mexican immigrants on his mother's side. Since his first term in Congress in 2019, Mike has established himself as a leader on climate action and clean energy. He served on the House Natural Resources Committee and on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. 
He introduced legislation to transition the nation to zero emission vehicles, expand renewable energy development, and prevent future offshore drilling. I'm also on the um, Environmental and Climate Change Council at Democrats Abroad, and it is just he is one of our heroes. Um, Mike also serves on the House Veterans Affairs Committee and leads the subcommittee on economic opportunity. He has introduced dozens of bipartisan bills to strengthen benefits and services for veterans and veteran homelessness and help veterans get through the COVID-19 pandemic. In his two terms in Congress, Mike has made the difference. Let's help him continue his great work. Now let's uh, watch his message to us. Hi, this is Congressman Mike Levin from California's 49th Congressional District. The upcoming midterm elections are incredibly important for the future of our country. Be sure to go to Vote From Abroad, that's votefromabroad.org, to register and request your ballot in this critical election. Winning this election will be a matter of turnout, and every vote matters. All right, thanks. And we'll go over to our next California team member. Hi, everyone. This is Asha to go over some key California voting information. Are we able to get the slide up? So, I mean, for those of you who may not know, California has some 50 congressional districts, of which 10 have been rated by Cook's Political Report and all sorts of other vetted um, polling groups as flippable. Um, and that just means that if we want to keep the House, it's going to be going through California. But as Congressman Levin just stated, California always has an issue with turnout. We assume we're a blue state. We miss all the deadlines. And before we know it, it's over and we didn't participate. And we can't have that happen this year for multiple reasons. We do have to get Alex Padilla in to the US Senate. We have those 10 federal House seats. And also, even if you're not in a flippable district, everyone gets to vote on Proposition 1, which is to add reproductive freedom to the California Constitution. This is a key thing that we need to get passed, not just for the people of California, but people from neighboring states who may need to use California in order to access their rights. So please, please, please do turn that ballot in, no matter where in California you're voting from. You should have received your ballot by today. Check your email, your promotion and spam folders to make sure that you have it. If you don't, you still have time to clear things up. Our registration deadline is quite late. It's October 24th. So if you need to re-register, you can do that. Um, if you're having trouble with your ballot or anything at all, please go to votefromabroad.org. One key story we've heard already is because we have 50 districts, some of them that are very, very close together with very twisted boundaries, there have been some mistakes of getting the wrong ballot. So please, please check, make sure you know what your new district is and that you are getting the correct ballot. Any questions, go to votefromabroad.org and I'll also drop a link in the chat about the district boundaries and how they changed in some resources. Um, you have for returning them uh, November 8th by fax. Faxing is a really great way to do it. Just please do it well in advance because that 8 p.m. deadline is very strict. And as we all know with international faxing, if you get some fumbles at the end, you could go right over that time. So please make sure you do it early in the day. If you do decide you want to post a mail it in, it does need to be postmark stamped on November 8th. You have until November 15th to get it in. There are just a lot of resources we've already put up on our website. So please do go to our website if you have any questions. And we are really, really proud. We just learned this week that Katie Porter will be joining us live, along with a lot of very essential key swing district candidates in California. So please do join us for that event. Thank you. And I think I'm handing it back over to Inga to introduce the next candidate. Hi, I think the next candidate is going to be um, introduced by Martha McDevitt Pugh.
Great. Um, thanks so much, uh, Asha, for that, and Inga for handing over to me. Uh, my name is Martha McDevitt Pugh. I am a lifelong California voter living in the Netherlands since 2000, uh, former chair of Democrats Abroad Netherlands, and I currently serve in my second term representing you all on the Democratic National Committee. And I am very honored to introduce uh, the video from my, uh, my own California Senator, Senator Alex Padilla. Uh, in January 2021, uh, Alex was appointed to the United States Senate to fill the vacancy created by the election of Vice President Kamala Harris. Yay! He was sworn in on January 20, 2021, and he is the first Latino to represent California in the United States Senate. The proud son of immigrants from Mexico, Senator Alex Padilla believes in giving everyone a fair shot at the American dream. A progressive problem solver, Senator Padilla has dedicated his career to finding solutions to the toughest challenges and fighting for communities that are too often left out and left behind. Uh, Senator Padilla is a lifelong California, born and raised in the proud working class community of Paco Ima in the San Fernando Valley. He was appointed to the United States Senate, uh, as I mentioned, to, create, to fill the vacancy created by uh, Vice President Harris. And um, he's also the first Latino to represent California in the US Senate. And he served as the 32nd Secretary of State in California from 2015 until 2021. And just to be really clear, Asha already mentioned it, but Senator Padilla is also on the ballot this year to give him a full six uh, year term as our own Senator. Um, so, uh, Senator Padilla is the first Latino to serve as the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, and Border Safety. His first bill was the Citizenship for Essential Workers Act, and it seeks to create a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who served as government recognized essential workers in key sectors during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'm just really moved uh, by who our Senator is, and I'm very happy to be here to um, introduce his video. So please, uh, please run the video. Hello, Democrats abroad. It's great to join you today as you get ready to vote in the upcoming midterm election. I want to start by just recognizing you for your active participation in the electoral process, even though you may be far from home. Uh, as you know, your voice matters and your vote matters, and it's no different whether you're here in the United States or you find yourself abroad. And there's going to be a lot on the ballot this November, from climate action to protecting voting rights and even our fundamental right to choose. We have a tough fight ahead of us to make progress on all these issues, and you can help by ensuring that we retain and expand our majorities in both the House and the Senate. We have shown America what is possible when Democrats are in charge, because in the last two years, Democrats have delivered big for our country. We passed the timely and critical COVID-19 relief package called the American Rescue Plan. We secured historic infrastructure investments that will be transformative for our country. We passed national gun safety reforms that will make our communities safer. We took on special interests to lower healthcare costs for millions of Americans. We've delivered on student loan relief, and we pushed forward the most aggressive action on climate change ever. But there's more work to do. These are major victories, our work is far from over, and I'm just not talking about progress on the issues that I just mentioned. I'm also talking about the very foundation of our democracy, something you appreciate more when you're outside of the United States. Because believe it or not, it's at stake this November. Right-wing election deniers are posing an existential threat to our democratic institutions. They're attacking the integrity of our elections by trying to call results into question. And they're running for office. They're winning GOP nominations in key battleground states across the country. In many states, they're even running in close secretary of state races, meaning if they win, they'll be responsible for administering elections and certifying election results. Imagine that. As California's former secretary of state, I know very well the grave threat that this poses for our free and fair elections. So that's why it's so important that we stand up for our democracy this November by casting our vote. You know, as uh, uh, we're just weeks from election day and races up and down the ballot will be decided by the thinnest of margins, making every vote critical. So if you haven't already, 
please visit www.votefromabroad.org or www.fvap.gov to ensure that you're registered to vote and that your ballot has been requested. And if you're feeling homesick and have a few minutes, please call friends and family in the states and make sure that they have a plan to vote as well. It's time to turn out, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'll head over to our North Carolina team. Thank you. Thank you, California. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening around the world. This is Tim Ormath, and I'm a lifelong voter in um, the state of North Carolina. Can everyone hear me okay? It is my um, great pleasure to introduce um, Lucy Inman, um, running for the North Carolina Supreme Court. Um, Lucy has served our state as a judge for the past 12 years. She is running for the Supreme Court because North Carolinians deserve justices who decide each case fairly and impartially, free of any political agenda and without fear or favor. For the past dozen years on the Superior Court and the Court of Appeals, Lucy Inman has done just that. The twin battles of abortion and gerrymandering are still ongoing in North Carolina. Lucy Inman's presence on the state Supreme Court would be a bulwark for women's rights and for one man, one vote in North Carolina. To quote Judge Inman, we refuse to wake up with any regrets on November 9th, so let's focus on reaching every voter we can. That's how we win. Democrats Abroad has been greatly honored to have welcomed Judge, uh, Judge Inman and, and Judge Irvin, who are both running for the North Carolina Supreme Court in a past um, session. That, that video is available to everyone, but it's now my great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Judge Lucy Inman to Democrats Abroad globally. Tim, we've not got Lucy on the call with us yet. Why don't we go ahead and skip on over to Sherry to see if Lucy comes on in just a minute. Okay, that sounds great. We will be coming back to my um, great colleague, Sylvia Squire, who will walk us through the North Carolina voting information in a couple of minutes. But it's uh, uh, my great pleasure to also introduce um, a, a video of our, our amazing candidate, um, uh, Sherry Beasley. Um, Sherry Beasley is not afraid to stand up to the powerful Washington insiders. She has proven throughout her years in public service that she cannot be bullied or intimidated out of doing what is right. Um, for the, everyone on the call who's not a North Carolinian, Sherry has won um, statewide races two times. Unfortunately, North Carolina has been in the news over the last 12 um, hours as the former guy has been in North Carolina, in Wilmington, North Carolina, with Sherry's um, opponent, as well as several other elected officials. Um, so you can certainly go, um, if you don't, if you want to waste some time, uh, hear a little bit about what he had to say in Wilmington last night. <laughs> what he, one of the things that he really got to was that super PACs are pouring millions limit literally limitless sums of money into this race to beat sherry they've already spent around 50 million trying to buy the seat our next senator sheet seat should not be for sale that's why we need to do everything we can to make sure sherry wins in sherry's own words quote together we have what it takes to win and deliver real change and meaningful progress in the senate the Senate race this year is of extreme importance given the current 50-50 balance between the two parties in the Senate, and Sherry's race really might um, determine whether we have um, uh, a majority and we can continue to enact President Biden's, Biden's extraordinary agenda. So I think we now have a video greeting from Sherry for us to share. Hi, my name is Sherry Beasley, the proud Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate in North Carolina. I'm honored to join the Democrats abroad for your ballot day rally. My husband, Kurt, and I raised our twin sons in North Carolina, and I've spent my life serving the state as public defender, judge, and chief justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, working to keep communities safe, uphold the Constitution, and protect our rights. As I'm sure you know, the votes of Democrats abroad have been vital in securing victories for Democrats across the country. So many congressional, state, and local races this cycle will be decided by the thinnest of margins. I know this firsthand. In 2020, my race for North Carolina Chief Justice came down to just 401 votes out of 5 million cast. When elections are this tight, every single vote is crucial it could be the difference between expanding our Senate majority and delivering real progress for Americans or keeping the status quo. Now that we have a real chance to turn North Carolina blue in 2022, 
but we can't do it without each of every one of you. You know that, which is why you're here today. We have real challenges, but we also have real opportunities for change, for a strong economy that supports small businesses, for a healthy state with clean air and clean water, no matter where you live, for a future in which all of our children can prosper, for a country where our rights are protected, for a country that keeps us all safe. But we cannot make these opportunities a reality if we don't protect and expand our Senate majority this November. In states like North Carolina, absentee voter ballots are hitting mailboxes now. So make sure to fill out your ballot and return your ballots right away, especially if you are in postal mail return states. You can also help with voter turnout by making sure your friends and family from North Carolina, both abroad and at home, have a plan to vote. My late mother was granted the right to vote by the Voting Rights Act, and if she were here today, she'd remind us that every election is the most important election of our lifetimes. Voting rights, climate change, women's reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, and so much more are on the line. Thank you again for your support. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Beasley, for those wonderful words. Um, Jennifer, is, has Lucy Inman been able to join us on the call? No sign of her, Tim. Maybe we can come back to her later if they're, if they're able to get on. I think we can go on. I will, I, I, I will send that message. So now I think now if I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sylvia, who's just going to walk us through the North Carolina voting uh, laws, correct? Okay. Let me just stop my video. Hi there. I thought I'd started my video, but it seems to be stuck. So here we are. Sorry, I've got the sunlight coming in through my window. <laughs> I tried to change it, but better to have sun than no sun. I think, you know, as you've just heard from Sherry Beasley um, mm -hmm. and from everybody else that has spoken, every single vote counts in every single state. There are important races. Um, North Carolina is as important as Pennsylvania, is as important as California. It doesn't matter where you are, you just need to vote. North Carolina's um, ballots were actually dropped on September 9th, quite early. And so that if you've not received your ballot, if you had requested one, registered and requested one and not received it, then certainly check with your local board of elections. Uh, go to votefromabroad.org, you can check there. Um, there is voter help, voter help at democratsabroad.org. Military families can go to the Federal Voting Assistance Program. There are multiple ways in which you can check to make sure that you receive your ballot and that you can send it back. A few important dates, which you can see on the slide there, the registration deadline is October 14th, ballot request deadline, November 1st, and the return deadline is November 8th. I think we all know that this November, we have an opportunity to elect leaders who are committed to addressing issues we care about and who will fight alongside us. We do need to vote, every single vote counts. As you've heard from Sherry just now, she was, in 2020, she was only 401 votes shy of being re-elected re re to the state Supreme Court. Don't let that happen this time when she's running for Senate. You know, we have to make sure that she gets in. The same goes for Justice Sam Irvin. The same goes for Judge Lucy Inman. You know, don't let the, them not be elected because of just a very few votes. And as we all know so well, Votes from abroad are the virgin of win or lose. So are the, on the right, you can be right on that margin. They're on the margin of win or lose. So please do vote, everybody. And now I think I hand back to either Tim or to Sherry, or to Jennifer. I'm not sure. We'll go to Judith. Hi. Great. Yeah, I think we're going on to music now. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Okay. So I am so pleased to uh, give you a little musical interlude here and introduce Mike. Mike is a San Francisco Bay Area singer and songwriter and activist and a sustainable energy consultant. He recently released his third album, Helsinki, an indie folk record that explores life's heartaches and exaltations. During the 2020 election, Mike released his popular satire video, it was so funny, Hit the Road Trump, 
and uh, brought some much needed smiles to YouTube. Mike is also on the working group of Music Declares Emergency US, an organization of musicians using the power of music to spur climate activism and political engagement. Prior to his musical foray, Mike directed several national emerg uh, energy consultancies and received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work on sustainable energy program evaluation and policy. And of course, Mike loves to support and get out the vote. So you can find Mike at his website, Spotify, and at Mike Rufo Music. So Mike, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you can hear me well enough? Oh yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you everyone um, for being here today. I'm really excited to be here and Calvin is really excited to be here. Uh, we're both excited to Rally, get out the vote. Thank you for everything you're doing for this election. Uh, every vote is going to matter. I have lived abroad. I lived in Sweden for a year at uh, Uppsala and uh, also worked in Spain for several months in the early 90s. And uh, my heart, part of my heart is always with my, my friends and, and family abroad. So yeah, to keep things moving along, uh, I'm going to play you a little song here and uh it's a new song short and sweet i put a little a little something about uh, relevant to, to today's event near the end and it goes like this just a little bit of loving just a little bit of loving too It's early. Usually I'm not singing this early unless I've been singing all night around a campfire, but it's 
Great to be with you. Thank you, Democracy uh, Democrats Abroad, for everything that you're doing to help people get out their vote abroad. I'm kind of appalled to see the statistics on how low a percent of people voting abroad is, but it also means that as uh, Democrats in this election, and we can make a huge difference uh, because we have a massive pool of voters living abroad that we can rally to make that difference. So thank you all so much. And uh, Democrats Abroad is doing a great job to help with everything. Thank you. Mike, thank you both for the beautiful musical interlude and the inspiration to vote. And now I'd like to introduce Carol Moore, who is going to tell us all about voting in Florida. Carol, unmute, please. Yes. Hello, yeah. everyone. Uh, is there a screen uh, about voting in Florida? Carol, Senator Osley is here. Why don't we go straight to her? That'd be great. I am thrilled to introduce Florida State Senator Loran Osley. She is joining us today and represents District 3, which covers Tallahassee and the surrounding counties. Loran is a lawyer, a mother, a triathlete, and most importantly, a dedicated state legislator. She has served 12 years in the Florida House of Representatives before winning an open seat to the Florida Senate in 2020. During her career, Loran has built a record of supporting funding for law enforcement, expanding affordable health care in a state that is one of the few that has not yet expanded Medicaid. She has also been working to protect natural resources and raising teachers and state workers' salaries. This year, the DeSantis gerrymander added several Republican counties to this district. Republicans are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to flip this district, and they have nominated a Florida State University football player uh, as her opponent. With virtually, he has virtually no policy statements. Lorraine, thank you so much for joining us today. Please tell us how DA can help you win in November. Thank you, Carol, um, and good morning. It's uh, it's great to be here um, and great to meet all of you. I, I'm a lifelong Floridian. My family has been in this part of Florida for a, a long time. And you know, growing up in Tallahassee is kind of like growing up in Washington, DC. You become a student of the legislative process. And I've had a firsthand view as I've watched legislators in the 70s and 80s when I was a kid um, worked together to set up the systems and structures that supported the explosive growth of Florida. Um, I was born in the 60s, we were 5 million, and today we're 21 million. Um, but Florida has been able to handle the growth because I, of the forward thinking and mostly Democratic leadership who created the structures that have allowed Florida to prosper. A flagship higher education system, a very strong K-12 through system, an affordable housing program and trust fund that once was the envy of the nation, and a land preservation program that manages 10 million acres of conservation land. These progressive people even put a right to privacy in our state constitution. But unfortunately, I've had an even closer view over the last two decades, 20 years, as Republican governors and legislatures have really dismantled and defunded these foundations that have allowed our state to, to flourish and prosper. They've slashed funding to higher ed creative voucher programs that are killing our public schools, creating inequities for our kids while they line the pockets of private companies, um, raided our affordable housing trust fund so that Florida, like the rest of the nation, is in a housing crisis, and raided the trust fund that protects our land and water, refusing to acknowledge what I think is probably the greatest threat to Florida, which is climate change. Um, in April of this year, we sort of all watched in horror as Florida passed a 15 week on abortion with no exception for rape or incest in clear violation of that state constitutional right to privacy. <laughs> but within two months, Florida now has, in a post Dobbs Florida world, we now have the most lenient abortion laws in the Southeast. Um, but I'm 100% certain that that's the first thing that uh, on the agenda the day after uh, the election if DeSantis is reelected. Um, so, Speaking of DeSantis, um, we haven't gotten there yet, but in the, in the almost four years since he's been elected, by a very small margin, mind you, 34,000 votes, DeSantis has led the charge in the culture wars, and the Republican legislature has fallen right in line. Um, in the past couple of years, and actually the two years I've been in the Senate, they've banned books and erased history. 
what, what's whole um, anti-woke act, ch chilling free speech in our classrooms and our boardrooms, criminalizing peaceful protests, intentional, very intentional voter suppression and intimidation of anyone who doesn't look or think like they do, um, criminalizing abortion as we've already talked about. And I think the most egregious and most recent stunt, um, the, you know, the flying of unsuspecting human beings from one part of our country to the other, these performative, illegal, unconstitutional stunts are nothing but gaining national attention and, and to maintain power. Um, so what does all this have to do with the Florida Senate? Um, we have very important races at the top of our ticket, which I wanna mention. If anyone can stop Ron DeSantis, it's Charlie Crist, and he is taking him, to, Charlie's taking Ron DeSantis task, to task every single day. Um, Val Demings is a rock star, and she has a real shot at taking out Rubio and helping us maintain control of US Senate. But the Florida Senate, like legislatures across the nation, the Florida Senate plays a really important role in Florida. With 40 senators in a state of 21 million people, that means our districts are half a million people. So it's like a mini congressional seat. And until recently, the Florida Senate has been a really important backstop to prevent some of these extreme measures. Today, Republicans are two senators away from a supermajority. And there are really only two races at play in, in Florida. And mine is one of them. My district is the north part of the state, it's 13 counties, stretches about 400 miles across the panhandle. Um, and I've spent 14 years as a legislator. I know how to work across the aisle. I know how to get things done for my district and to make sure we're preserving the Florida that I grew up in for my kid and hopefully, hopefully my grandkids. Um, so I've been elected to the Florida House six times. Two years ago, I ran for an open seat in the Senate. And um, Carol said hundreds of thousands. Um, you might be shocked to know that the Republicans spent five million dollars that we know of um, in that race. We spent about three million. So it was an eight million dollar race last time. And we won by seven points. But this is by far the toughest race I've ever faced. As mentioned, the district is redder. And Ron DeSantis has recruited an African-American star football player. And for those of you who are aware of what happens in the South, football is pretty important down here. And so he's pretty well known. And we expect them to possibly double what they spent the last time. Um, they're sitting on about $20 million. So half of that would be $10 million um, because Ron DeSantis has taken this on. He wants to take over Tallahassee and he wants to have a supermajority in the Florida Senate. We have a great team. We have a great plan. We are executing our plan. We just need the resources to stay competitive. Um, I am competitive. That's sort of one of my, maybe my, my little secret weapons. I am a, um, I've, I've completed four Ironmans um, and I uh, tend to approach my elections like I approach Ironman training. There is no one who will outwork me. Um, and I know you're hearing from some great folks, many of whom are my friends today, and all of us are fighting the good fight across the country. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the importance of down ballot races that don't get as much attention because they are really important right now with so much at stake. Um, our website is osleyforsenate.com. Check it out and um, we would be grateful for your support. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the ground here in Florida. Well, Senator, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and giving us a briefing on the um, terrible onslaught of Republican money uh, that is happening in, across Florida, but of course, across the country. Um, here are some of the races. We just wanna encourage our voters to vote. We have thousands of Florida voters and Democrats abroad, and we're trying to reach more Florida voters uh, overseas. Um, so we wish you well, and we hope we might be able to get to see you again. Uh, because we want to win, uh, uh, really encourage down ballot voting. There are, as um, the Senator mentioned, the two critical races, Val Demings and Charlie Crist, but all the races are critical. Uh, and one I just will last mention is to vote no on an unusual race in Florida to retain Florida's Supreme Court justices. There are five Republican appointed justices and you should vote no for retention. 
Uh, if Chris is elected, he could appoint five new judges to the Supreme Court. There are the deadlines, please. And questions, if you have them, go to fl at um, uh, democratsabroad.org and I'll be happy to answer them. And with that, I'll hand back to Jennifer. Thank you and bye. Hi, thank you so much. And we're gonna head over to our Wisconsin team. Teresa? All right, we can also jump straight on to Texas because I see that Luke Warford is here with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce him and we will come back to Wisconsin in just a minute. This is such a big event. We've got so many people joining us today <laughs> and then we have a packed full schedule. So I'm gonna take the uh, opportunity to introduce our candidate for railroad commissioner, Luke Warford. He is a former Texas Democrat abroad and he is running for this important nationwide race and it's really the battle to fight climate change. Um, Luke has a master's in development policy from the London School of Economics and a professional background in economics and policy. He began his political career on the 2012 Obama campaign and his current platform is focused on reforming the Texas Railroad Commission following winter storm Uri in 2021, which includes creating weatherization standards and investing in renewables to reduce emissions and keep Texan energy relevant on the international markets. Luke is the youngest statewide candidate in over 30 years in Texas, and we cannot wait to hear from him. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you, Luke. Hey, y'all. Hey, Democrats abroad, and especially uh, Texas Democrats abroad. As a former Texas Democrat abroad, it is uh, great to be with you all this morning. Um, for Texans, uh, but also for folks not from Texas, uh, my name is Luke Warford. I'm the Democratic nominee for an office called the Texas Railroad Commission, which, um, as you heard from Jennifer's introduction, has nothing to do with railroads anymore. It's a very Texan thing that this name still exists. But what the office actually does is it regulates the Texas oil and gas industry which makes it truly one of the most important elected offices, not just in the state of Texas, but across the country from the perspective of our environment and our emissions. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but also from the perspective of last February's grid failure and Texans ability to keep the lights on. Um, something that I'm sure a lot of y'all may have experienced if you were in, in Texas or in the States last February, but definitely heard about if you weren't, is that last February, we had this massive statewide uh, grid failure where millions of people lost power, there was billions of dollars in damages, and hundreds of Texans literally froze to death in 2021 in the energy capital of the world. And um, the reason that I'm running for Texas Railroad Commission, there's a lot of them, obviously, but one of the most significant ones is that the Texas Railroad Commission could have prevented last February's grid failure because the largest uh, individual cause of the grid failure was a drop in natural gas supply um, caused by a lack of weatherization or preparation for cold weather. And it had been the Railroad Commission's job to make sure those preparations happened. For folks in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin who are on this call, um, in, in those states, when it gets really cold, your natural gas doesn't fail. But here in Texas, we didn't have a weatherization rule. Um, and that meant natural gas producers weren't prepared. When temperatures dropped, natural gas went offline. And then that led to the grid failure. Um, we had all of these warnings going back to 2011. There were all of these expert recommendations basically telling uh, the Texas Railroad Commission to make these preparations. They didn't do it. It's now been 18 months. We're still not any more prepared. Um, instead, what my opponent does is, has done is he's blamed renewable energy for the grid failure. He's passed the cost, $3.4 billion in costs onto Texas consumers uh, that we will be paying off for decades in terms of higher utility bills. Um, and we're not any safer or more prepared for the next time it gets cold. Um, the second really important thing about this race, and this connects to um, Jennifer's introduction about my background, so I'm, I'm 33 years old. I'm the youngest Democrat to run statewide in more than 30 years. Um, and uh, this is my first time running for office. And I've, got a, I've worked in the energy sector. I've worked in politics. 
Um, I lived in Ethiopia, I worked at the African Union on energy policy uh, in East Africa. Um, and the reason, the other reason I decided to run for this office is because the issues that are at stake here are just so incredibly urgent, right? I, you know, folks early on when I decided to run said, oh, have you considered a different office or waiting until you're older or, or whatever? Um, but I just think uh, the, the grid failure is incredibly urgent. But then the other really important issue on this race is climate change and emissions, um, where this race has been called the uh, most important climate election in the country uh, because Texas is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the United States. The oil and gas industry is the biggest source of those emissions. Um, and literally millions of tons of methane and other greenhouse gases come uh, from our state every year because my opponent, Wayne Christian, cannot be bothered to enforce the existing rules. It's not even about making new policy. It's simply, you know, they're granting thousands of flaring exemptions, which is a major source of greenhouse gases. They're not identifying and stopping methane leaks. They're being incredibly uh, slow and, and um, inefficient in their uh, capping of orphan wells. And what that does is it results in a huge amount of unnecessary greenhouse gases being emitted every year. And so the reason that this race matters to folks on this call outside of Texas is that I genuinely think um, it, there is a huge opportunity to reduce emissions by getting a Democrat elected to this office. Um, now, the last thing I want to say is that you might be asking yourself, OK, this is a, a statewide position in Texas. No Democrat has won. Uh, statewide in Texas in 30 years, is, is it possible for a Democrat to win this seat? And I think the thing that I would say is absolutely yes. And there's a, a few reasons for that. First, um, we've seen recently that the polls really are narrowing um, in this state. And concretely for this race, we were down 11 points back in March. In our most recent poll three weeks ago, we were down, down just four points. The second thing is that we have massively closed the cash on hand gap with our opponent. I'm running against a 72-year-old uh, uh, career politician who takes literally 99% of his campaign contributions from the oil and gas industry, who has said that he thinks the answer to climate change is turning up the air conditioning. That is a real, that is a real quote from Wayne, Christ Wayne Christian. Um, and despite all of those things, despite the fact that he's getting big checks from oil and gas executives, we've actually massively closed the cash on hand gap. We outraised him in the last fundraising period, three to one. We have thousands of supporters from across the state and across the country, um, and we totally have the momentum in this race. Uh, and so the fact that the polls are close, the fact that we have been able to continue to fundraise um, in a strong, in a, have strong fundraising numbers, I think shows that this race is absolutely winnable. And then the last thing I would just say is that the energy on the ground um, here in the state is, is palpable, right? And in particular, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to hear this from folks all across the country today, um, but in the last few months, last few months, there has truly been a significant increase in energy, engagement, excitement, even in our race where, you know, we're focused mostly on keeping the lights on, lowering utility prices and lowering emissions. We've still seen um, you know, amazing support, amazing turnout for our events. I've been on the road with Beto with, you know, thousands of people at these events that, that we're speaking at. I um, mean, I think there's, uh, there's a hope and there's uh, an excitement in Texas that if we keep doing the work, we can actually um, win, uh, win this November. So thank you all uh, for having me. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Um, I imagine if you're on this call, you're going to be great about getting your ballots in. Uh, I used to work on voter registration and, and voter information, so huge advocate um, for all of this. And, and if you want to support our campaign, um, you can go to lukewarford.com uh, to volunteer, to donate. We've got a digital um, vo online volunteer team that's doing a lot of work to try to just educate people about this important race. But um, thank you all for having me. Thanks for, for, for everything you're doing. And, and uh, Hopefully on November 9th, we'll have some good news to share. Awesome. We for that. November. Thank you so much. We're so glad that you could join us in person today. And we wish you the best of luck on the, the train trail. We, I love that, the, the train tour. And we really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand over to our chair, Candace Karastan now.
Candice, you're muted. Can you unmute? Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, Luke. It was great to hear from you. Uh, just wanted to tune in. We're a little over an hour through today's program, uh, but still a lot of good bits on the way. Just wanted to highlight we're going to be hearing from our Wisconsin state team of Democrats abroad and some of their fantastic candidates. We're going to head down to Arizona. We're going to swing by Georgia. And last but not least, then we're going to hear from our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, before wrapping up today's event. Before we do that, though, we're going to talk about, again about how you can get involved with Democrats Broad, how that you can help us make sure that we are getting out the overseas vote, we're getting out uh, every single U.S. citizen and dual citizen, both at home and abroad, that they are voting on November 8th. I know you've had a lot of dates coming your way today, depending on which state you vote out of. Just wanted to say short and sweet, the, the crux of the message is, if you are a US citizen, you can vote. If you requested your ballot in 2022, you should have received it by today. Uh, again, if you have not requested your ballot, you can do so at votecomeabroad.org. You'll also find all the information there about your state's deadlines, about how you can return the ballot in your state. Uh, all of that is on votecomeabroad.org. And if you have any questions, we are here to help info at democratsabroad.org. Please do not let anyone tell you that you cannot vote. You can, and we're here to help make sure that you do. Uh, so Jennifer is gonna talk a little bit later on, again, about all of our programs right now running to battleground state voters. So all of these fantastic candidates who you've seen from Florida uh, to Arizona, Pennsylvania, uh, we are calling and doing outreach right now to activate even more voters who are going to have the, the ability to vote for these great candidates. So we'd love for you to plug into our phone banking campaigns. I won't steal too much from Jennifer. I know she's going to say more, uh, but we have a lot going on in these next 45 days, and we would be thrilled to have your help so that we can get everyone we've heard from elected to office this November 8th. If you can, again, please pitch in uh, contributions of any size, greatly appreciated. They help fund things like today's event, our Zoom platforms, our phone banking, our postal mailing, uh, all of the programs, our digital ads right now we have running all around the world targeting battleground state voters. Your contribution at democratsabroad.org will help us continue that through November 8th. So with that, I'll toss it back, but thank you everyone. And let's look forward to Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, and Nancy. All right. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Jennifer. I am Teresa Ritterhoff, a DA membership engagement coordinator and a founding member of Wisconsin Nights Abroad. I am thrilled to introduce Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, the next senator from the great state of Wisconsin. Proud son of a union family, Mandela is looking to be a voice for all Wisconsinites and against the filibuster that has held back progress for too long. I just want to remind all Wisconsinites on this call, every single Wisconsinite has the right and opportunity to cast a ballot for this inspirational candidate fighting for a better future and not least fighting to send Ron Johnson packing. Very excited to hear Mandela's message for all of us at Democrats Abroad. So let's roll the tape. Now, my story is a Wisconsin story. It's a story about the opportunities of American manufacturing and the strength of American labor unions. It's a story that's only possible because my grandfather who moved to Milwaukee after serving in World War II laid a foundation for my American dream to be realized. Now, it's time for us to be represented by people who share our experiences and our Wisconsin values. Values that all of you have taken with you across the globe, wherever you may be. I'm the proud son of a middle-class union family. And like most people in Wisconsin, I'm not a millionaire. I don't have the backing of big pharma or the backing of big oil. But what I do have is skin in the game. I have the backing of honest, hardworking people just like you. And while Ron Johnson continues to stack the deck against us, we won't give up. Because in our greatest challenges, I believe our greatest opportunities, we have an opportunity to give everyone a fair shot. We also have an opportunity to protect our environment, 
an opportunity to build a nation that all of you are proud to call home. And I know that it's going to be hard, but everything worth doing is hard. But hard, that part doesn't scare me. Because I know it'll be that much easier when we join and we do this work together. I'm running for Senate because I believe that better is possible. Now, this is a fight for freedom, a fight for fairness, and a fight for our future. And this is a fight we're going to win. So to all the Wisconsinites abroad, just want to say thank you so much, and let's move forward together. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Wisconsinites broad section of this. Do we have a slide with our voting rules? I'd like to talk to you about some deadlines and what you have to do to submit your ballot and your voting request for the state of Wisconsin. We have some important races coming up this fall. As you know, we're going to be voting for the candidate to de defeat Wisconsin, the United States worst Senator Ron Johnson. So we're all voting for Mandela Barnes, the governor, Tony Evers, who is the blue wall standing between a rogue state legislature and the good people of Wisconsin. And we also have a lot of important races for state legislature and for the House of Representatives and the Attorney General, Josh Call. Do we have a, a slide? There we go, thanks. So if you have not yet registered to and requested your ballot, that your FPCA must be sent by October 19th. And if this is your first time registering, you must send that back by postal mail with a wet signature. Your ballot request deadline is November 3rd. And your email, your ballot will be sent to you by email if you mark the box requesting email delivery. As soon as you get that ballot, fill it out, get it witnessed, and send it back. Regarding sending your ballot back, it must be sent by postal mail or courier, or you can put it in the diplomatic pouch if you have a consulate or an embassy nearby. But you must have it witnessed by an adult. It does not have to be a US citizen anymore, but it does have to be an adult. And they need to put their full address on the certificate. That includes house address, zip code, city, and country. You can only send back one ballot per envelope as of new legislation this year in the state of Wisconsin. And that's also true if you're sending back by courier. And if this is your first time registering, you can include a hard copy of your FPCA if you send it back by that deadline of October 19th. So let's all get our vote out for Wisconsin and do better for our good state. Thank you. All right, we've got Liz come from China and she's got a video for us to do the introduction for Tony Evers. We got it, Laura, otherwise. Oh, it's Hi, my name is Liz Blackburn. I'm calling in from Democrats Abroad China, where members here in Shanghai have gathered to enjoy the watch party, to mark their ballots and send them in, as well as to register to vote. And speaking of, I'm ready to make my choice for the very special seat of governor of the great state of Wisconsin. And there it is. I've cast my ballot for Governor Tony Evers. Governor Evers has been a guiding light through one of the murkiest periods in Wisconsin politics. With his veto, Governor Evers has been the last line of defense against a state legislature gone rogue. He even told us that if he didn't win the election, everything he's vetoed thus far will be coming back as law of the land. That includes guns on school grounds to limiting voting rights. 
and his words ring true. Ben Wickler, chair of Wisconsin Democrats, has been warning us that Wisconsin is ground zero for democracy in the United States and is well on its way to becoming a state that votes democracy out. Now, Wisconsinites intending to return are able to vote in critical statewide elections such as this one and will help reelect Governor Evers. Governor Tony Evers is doing the right thing in Wisconsin. So we need to do the right thing now, Wisconsinites. We need to get up, get up, get out and out organize to win in these tight races. So let's do it, Wisconsin. Let's do it, DA. Governor Evers, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Hello, Democrats abroad. I'm Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers. I'm thrilled to speak to you tonight to help elect Democrats up and down the ballot. I want to thank Teresa Rittenhoff for inviting me to speak. Her leadership is really appreciated. Thank you to everyone who has gotten involved with Democrats abroad. There is so much at stake this fall, and it's critical that you exercise your right to vote, no matter where you are. Democrats across the country are fighting to protect a woman's right to choose, supporting public education, taking action on climate change, and protecting the right to vote. But our work is not finished. We need your help to continue moving our state and our country forward. There's so much on the line. We need to elect Democratic governors around the country and help Democrats build support in Congress, starting with flipping our Republican-held Senate seat right here in Wisconsin. We're counting on people like you to vote and to be a part of this movement. When we organize, bring people together, and encourage our friends and neighbors to vote, guess what? We win. Thank you in advance for your support. We're counting on you. Hi. <laughs> I am so pleased to be able to introduce Kira Sedgwick. Kira is an actress, a producer, and a director. She was nominated for a Golden Globe Award and was the winner of the People's Choice and an Emmy. You may know her as Deputy Chief Brenda Lee Johnson in The Closer. I love The Closer. Um, or Deputy Chief Madeline Wunsch in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, or one of her other 72 roles in movies and television. You may know her as the wife of Kevin Bacon and the mother of Travis and Sosie. She is all of that, but what you may not know is that she is also, that she and Kevin are both activists and carry on the family tradition of being advocates for social justice. So Kevin is sorry, he can't join us today. He is shooting a film this weekend. So you are all now one degree of separation from Kevin Bacon. We are so pleased that you are here, Kira. Um, so, the, and that you are joining us on ballot day. Thank you so much, Judith. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I, like everybody here, um, I, I think I'm at my absolute limit uh, of fear. And, um, and I, <laughs> I know it's a hyper, it always sounds like a hyperbole to say that we are uh, on the cusp of losing our democracy, but as witnessed by um, the latest Dobbs uh, decision in the Supreme Court, we truly have lost the right to choose in many, many, many states. Um, I think one of the things that scares me most about uh, this up upcoming election, and there's a lot of things, um, is the idea that um, the Senate will take up making it a federal law to uh, outlaw abortion. Um, that scares me. Um, a lot of other things scare me, um, rulings around uh, other privacy issues and certainly climate, any climate issue is sort of the reason I think that I was you know, inspired to get into any kind of activism 33 years ago when I had my first child out of a complete selfish 
you know, desire, need for my child to have a future, the future for, and the ways, all the ways in which I've taken for granted my clean air, my clean water, um, everything's at stake this, uh, this election cycle. Um, and Democrats abroad is going to be a huge part of that. Um, I look at the amount of people that are here today and I think, well, you know, if you bring five friends, you know, if you inspire five friends, you know, think of the exponential impact that can have. Um, everyone needs to do their part. And I know for me that the biggest solution to all of my fear and all of my despair is action. You know, and I really, I feel personally that if I'm not part of the solution, that I am part of the problem. Um, nothing makes me feel better than to be able to take an action every single day. So I'm so grateful for Judith um, for asking me today. And I know it's ballot day and how wonderful that you have the right to fill out all of your ballot all the way down, all the way down to the bottom. Um, even though you've chosen to live abroad, which I can completely understand and applaud uh, that choice. Um, and, uh, and I'm super grateful to also, uh, I am gonna call Kevin because he wanted to say a word and I'm gonna put him on speaker, um, but we're really happy to be with you all today and really, really hope that um, you're inspired to you know, tell everybody you know to, to do the same thing, whether they're abroad or stateside. Um, okay, here's Kevin. Okay, here we go, speak. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I yes, they can hear you. Yes, you're definitely on speaker. Okay, so I've said this before, but what she said. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to these things, I'm sorry, I tried to uh, jump onto the Zoom, but I couldn't fight my way through. But um, I, I think that uh, we, we said it before, and it's a little bit cliche, but it's never been more important than this moment uh, when we see our... Uh, democracy being threatened in the way that it is right now. I love um, this country. I, I love the American people. I think that we um, always have an opportunity to be better and better. And we need everybody's help. And especially uh, when it comes to voting. So thank you all for even now joining in today. It shows that you do um, care about democracy and you do care about your country and whatever you do to uh, encourage your friends and uh, neighbors overseas or, or at home to get out there and make your voice heard. This is our right. This is an honor. This is something that we all need to be part of. Thanks. Thank you, honey. I, I just want to say one more thing, and that is I, I heard in, you know, somewhere in this Twitter sphere, Instagram sphere, this concept of the real revolution in this country would be if everybody voted. And, you know, it's really amazing to think like, oh, God, that's it. That's all I have to do is vote. And, you know, it's I know in some states they've made it really hard, but um, but we still have the right to vote in this country. So let's exercise that right. Thanks so much for asking me to be on today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank Kevin too. And now I believe Jennifer is going to go on and talk about the six degrees of action we can take. Awesome. Thank you so much, Judith. And we're so glad that Kira could join us today. Um, we'll just do really quick. We've got some wonderful actions that we would love for you to take. Eileen, could we put that up? Thank you so much. I know Candace mentioned phone banking earlier. Please, please, please join our phone banking team. This is the best way to reach overseas voters. These are our members we're calling and some of them don't even know they can vote in midterm elections. So we've got to get that word out. You can write to your alma mater. You can let them know that study abroad students can request their ballots and vote. And we just also want to know that the easiest thing you can do is just click that donate link and help fund all of these amazing things that, uh, that we're doing with Democrats abroad. 
Um, another amazing thing that we do with Democrats Abroad is provide voter assistance. And it is our job and our mission to help you get your ballots back, even if you run into obstacles. And um, we've got a member of our team here today. If you need any help with your ballot and you want to jump over, we're going to open up a breakout room. You can do that. We'd love for you to get trained to, to find out how you can help um, people in your circle to get to vote or to join our voter assistance team. We'll put all those links in the chat. And we're so grateful that Kira Sedgwick could join us. And if you participate in our Six Degrees of Action campaign, you can win some great prizes, including a phone call from Kevin and Kira or an autographed copy of Mark Kelly's book, Mousetronaut, that says Reach for the Stars. You can see it on our page. It's amazing. And I really want to win it myself. So thank you so much. And I am going to hand over to Katie Sullen to introduce our next candidate. Thanks, Jennifer, very much. We are now moving down to the Southwest, everyone. We're on our way to Arizona. Adrian Fontes is running for Secretary of State in Arizona, and this is one of the most critical races in the country. Demo dem democracy is definitely on the ballot in Arizona. In 2016, after witnessing six hour lines at the polls, only in the low income neighborhoods in the Arizona heat, Adrian decided to run for Maricopa County Recorder. Maricopa County has 62% of Arizona's voters, and it is now the second largest voting county in the US. He won, and he became the first Latino to win countywide office, and he became the first Democrat to hold that office in 50 years. He and his team reformed the system, the gold standard, that they developed made voting more accessible, secure, and transparent. They added 500,000 voters in 2020 to the Maricopa County turnout. And their system not only held up to that addition, but it held up to the intense scrutiny that we all saw on Arizona during the election, during the count, and afterwards. And so, Adrian, welcome back straight from the cover of Time Magazine last week, back to Democrats Abroad. The mic is yours. Thank you so much, Katie, and hello, Democrats, whithersoever dispersed about the globe. My name is Adrian Fontes, and uh, I'm an Arizona native. My family's been in the southwestern desert here since the 1690s. Uh, we, we don't move nearly as much as most of you guys do about the place. We just kind of stick around. Uh, I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I'm a former prosecutor, and I was, uh, as Katie said, the Maricopa County Recorder. Um, th this is a this is the one. This race right here represents uh, more starkly uh, than any other in the nation the difference between uh, the election deniers uh, and the folks who are holding the line. As Katie indicated, I was the chief election administrator in Maricopa County. You remember uh, not too long ago. Uh, we kicked the cyber ninjas right in the uh, right in the ankle. I, I, I've got to be polite on this call because global standards require that. Uh, yeah. and, and, and they couldn't hold up. We built a bipartisan team here, Republicans and Democrats alike. And we managed to get a four to one Republican Board of Supervisors to help us build uh, what is now one of the best election systems in the United States of America. We're very, very glad. But we're running against the worst of the worst. My opponent, uh, his name's Mark Fincham. He doesn't have Voldemort powers. His name's Mark Fincham. Uh, he was at the January 6th insurrection. But worse than that, he's an oath keeper going back to 2014. He is an anti-Semite. He's called for civil war in the United States of America and the stockpiling of weapons and ammunition. He is a dangerous person. And for folks uh, who know Arizona's voters, which, by the way, vote about 87, 88% by mail, he has said that if he becomes Secretary of State, not only will he completely eliminate ballot by mail voting, that no excuse absentee voting that so many Arizonans use and enjoy, particularly uh, disabled veterans, the elderly and people in rural areas, he'll not only kill that system, uh, but he's also said effectively uh, that the only difference between 2020 and any other election was the candidates. That's right. He said that in our debate just two nights ago. It's the candidates. For him, it's about the politics. It's about the outcome. It's not about a fair system and democracy and American voters' votes. It's not about that for him. It's just about Donald Trump. That's it. We've got to fight against that. We've got to be the bulwark against that kind of nonsense. Uh, it's not just my race, however. 
Um, we've got to work hard uh, in across Arizona. We're the one state, as I understand, where we've got election deniers uh, running for U.S. Senate, for governor, for secretary of state, for attorney general, uh, and on and on and on. We, we, we've got them here, uh, and we need your help. Uh, what we're going to do after we win is uh, bring the uh, uh, ballot tracking system that we created to every single voter in Arizona. That's a system where you get a text message or an email notification sent to you uh, to show you that your ballot's not only coming to you, but when it gets back to the election department, you get a push notification. Uh, that's going to help us rebuild confidence in Arizona's election systems. We're going to reach out to all of our communities uh, from our good friends uh, up in the Winslow and um, other parts of northeastern Arizona, Cayenta, all the way down uh, to folks in cells and the southeastern or southwestern side of the state in the Tohono O'odham uh, reservations. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, we've only got 45 days left to do it. Uh, and early voting, as many of you know, starts in Arizona, other than for you all who should be getting your ballots today uh, on October the 12th. So call your friends, call your neighbors, uh, let everybody in Arizona know that we've got to have uh, reasonable, uh, good, solid-minded folks running our government. But it's not just about elections. I'll close on this point. Remember that elections are the golden thread that run through the fabric of our society. But the other threads depend on that one. You pull that golden thread out, the entire fabric disintegrates. We're talking about business, tech, law, education, medicine, the arts and sciences. All of it depends on election. You guys know this because you're on this call. You know this because you've seen it disintegrate in other parts of the world. Please, please, please help us out. My name is Adrian Fontes. With your help, Democrats abroad, uh, and, and, and a little bit of grace, uh, I hope I will become Arizona's next Secretary of State. Thanks for what you do, and uh, let's go in. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you for coming back to us. Please know that we have your back and we are going to turn out more overseas Arizona voters than have ever voted in a midterm. And I think, Jennifer, now we're going to talk about how those voters can vote if they don't know. Is that right? So we have a slide about voting from abroad in Arizona. Um, like so many of you, ballots are out. We are receiving them if the voter already requested it and asked for the ballot to come by email. Every overseas voter can get their ballot by email if they request it. Um, I don't see the slide, but I'm going ahead without the slide. Couple, two special things about Arizona. One, we are an electronic return state. That means you can return your ballot either by upload or by email. Please do one or the other of those things. They are faster, safer, and more reliable than sending it by the post. The instructions come with your ballot, or you can go to votefromabroad.org to find instructions or to the flag page, democratsabroad.org 2022, and click on the Arizona flag. The other special thing about Arizona, there are a number of states where not everybody gets a full ballot if you're overseas. In Arizona, you only get a full ballot if you mark on the request form that you intend to return. That's not defined. You don't need a date of return. If you do mark that on the request, you will get a full ballot and you can vote for Adrian Fontes and Katie Hobbs and our state legislators. However, if you mark on that request form that your return is uncertain, also completely undefined, you will get a federal only ballot which means that you get to vote for Mark Kelly and defend five US House seats that are close and flip my district against the awful incumbent indicted, corrupt, uh, illegal use of funds person, Schweikert with wonderful Jevin Hodge. So know that when you're marking your request form, the difference between a full and a federal ballot. Um, there's some links going in the chat Whatever ballot you get, make sure you vote all of it, every race. There's a voting guide link that went into the chat from Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. Key races, Mark Kelly for Senate, Adrian Fontes for Secretary of State, 
Katie Hobbs, our current Secretary of, Secretary of State for Governor. Um, we have a great Attorney General, Chris Mays. We've got, like I said, five Democratic US congressional seats, House seats to defend, one to flip, and then finally, the majority in our state House and our state Senate has been held by Republicans as long as almost everybody can remember. And right now that majority is one seat in either House. We flip one seat in Arizona and we can take the House, the Senate and the governorship and reverse all of these bad bills because the issues on the ballot are abortion, gun rights, school funding, minimum wage, uh, any bad bill that you've heard about in any state in the last couple of years has been passed in Arizona by our Republican majority and governor. Please, Arizonans, get your ballots and vote. Let's reverse that. Let's move Arizona forward. Thank you very much. Last point, phone bank with us. Write to Arizona's Ariz AZ at democratsabroad.org. We are phone banking together to get out the Arizona vote, calling DA members, and calling other overseas Arizonans that are not yet DA members. And I think with this, and speaking of fantastic secretaries of state, I'm handing over to Georgia. Is that right, Jennifer? I wish that we could go to Beadwin from Georgia, but she is not able to join right this minute. She is on the campaign trail and they are having a little bit of technical difficulty because we may yet hear from her. The good news is we're going to get to hear from Lucy Inman after um, um, in just about 20 minutes. She is going to be able to join us after all, but I'm going to let um, my colleague at Georgians Abroad, Camille DeAim, go ahead and, and tell us about Beadwin just in case she can't make it because this is another crucial Secretary of State race. So I'm going to hand over to you, Camille. Hi. So B. Wynn is running in one of the most important Secretary of State races in the country. She is running against Brad Raffensperger, who admittedly had a good moment, but in general has a lousy record in protecting voters in Georgia. If elected, B. will be fighting for the rights of all Georgians to have their voices heard at the ballot box. She has already demonstrated how convincingly she uses facts to refute disinformation. Before she was elected to the legislature, she served as chief, chief of staff to Representative Sam Park, where she advocated for progressive policies and fought against discriminatory policies, including policies targeting women, the LGBTQ community, and the immigrant community. B made historic when she was elected as the first Asian American Democratic woman in the Georgia General Assembly in House District 89, the seat formerly held by Stacey Abrams. At the Georgia State Capitol, B is a leading advocate for voting rights, public education, and criminal justice reform. Unfortunately, she's not joining us at this point, hopefully later today. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Camille. And I'm going to hand over to Mike to introduce our next musician. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? It's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend and a musical inspiration, uh, Sarah Songbird Larkin. She's going to uh, play us a song. And uh, Sarah's just uh, based in Northern California. She's an amazing songwriter and uh, is known for her work with her acoustic ensemble, The Real Sarah's. She's currently working on a new album with Grammy nominated fingerstyle guitarist Alex Degrassi. And uh, her songs often explore and uplift the experience of women in American society. I've been really inspired by Sarah's music, her heart, and her journey. Uh, we don't usually get to choose the adversity we have to deal with in life. And um, I've seen Sarah's had to deal with some the last few years uh, that has been challenging. And she's just continued to amaze me with her resilience and open heartedness and creativity uh, through adversity. So she's got some words and a nice inspiring song for us. Thank you. My name is Sarah Larkin, and I'm coming to you from Northern California with an offering of a brief original song called It Might Grow. This song is a 
question about what gifts are you bringing in your lifetime? What thoughts and actions are you putting in motion and how that has effect on the world? And in the framework of this critical election and of your crucial participation in this election, what things are you putting in motion? How will this affect the direction of our country? How can it affect the evolution of our nation and even the direction that the world is moving in? Be careful what you sow. It might grow. There is infinite potential in this life. Don't you know? What can you do? What are you bringing? I came here for singing. I want to leave in the past, make the most of the moment while it lasts, with thankfulness and forgiving, I'm gonna make my life a living, oh, 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 I'm gonna make my life a living, da 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 it makes me think about a man, well he's got dirt on his hard working hands, his back is tired and his head is hurting. But he just keeps working he Wishes he could stay at home And turn off his mind Turn off his phone But kids are hungry And the rooster's crowing So it just gets going Be careful what you sow It might grow There is infinite potential In this life Don't you know What can you do What are you bringing I came here for singing I want to leave the past in the past Make the most of the moment While it lasts Thankfulness and forgiving Cause I'm right where I should be Give thanks for this time and space I try to keep a smile on my face I'm gonna fly There'll be no weight in my paradise It's one I'm creating Careful what you sow It might grow There is infinite potential in this life Don't you know What can you do? What are you bringing? I came here for singing I wanna leave the past in the past Make the most of the moment while it lasts Thanks for doing your part. That was so wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Annie to introduce our next guest. All right. I am so pleased to introduce our next guest, Lee McGowan. Lee started Politics Girl after the second Obama midterm election in 2014, when Mitch McConnell's Republican caucus in the Senate declared that they would do nothing but obstruct progress for the next two years. At that point, Lee realized that her friends and family were not as upset about this as she was, and were not, for the most part, even participating in politics because they didn't understand it, and that this lack of civic education was a feature rather than a bug of the US educational system. Since then, she has been talking common sense on her Politics Girl podcast, YouTube channel, and Twitter feed to US voters, and to a growing base of overseas fans who understand, perhaps even better than many Americans do, that what happens in US elections has global consequences. A couple of months ago, we reached out to Lee on Twitter and asked if she would speak to Democrats abroad, and she immediately agreed, recognizing the potential impact of our overseas votes. Since then, she has been a wonderful ally to the DA cause, amplifying our message to her millions of followers on social media and speaking directly to overseas Americans about the power of our votes. And it is an honor to have her here with us today. <clears throat> Welcome, Lee, and it's great to finally see you. 
Oh, hello, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, what a wonderful event you're having here today. As Annie said, my name is Lee McGowan, but I go by Politics Girl Online. I'm the host of the Politics Girl podcast, but if you know me, it's probably from those viral breakfast rants where I'm doing short political commentary from my kitchen here in California. I am also an immigrant. I was born and raised in Canada, but I happened to be living in New York City during 9-11. And like a lot of people, that day really changed my life. Um, the horror of that experience bonded me to the city, the spirit and patriotism I felt bonded me to this country, and the political response really bonded me to the Democrats. So when George Bush won his second term, I knew I could never watch another American election and not vote. So I had to be a citizen. I love this country, but I also needed to play my part and try and make it better. So moving here, I bought into all the American bumper stickers, you know, like the can do attitude and the land of the free and the home of the brave and this place of opportunity where anyone from anywhere could make it if they just worked hard enough. But the closer I looked and the more I paid attention, the more I could see that we weren't really living up to our brochure, right? That this land with the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor didn't really want all immigrants and that the nation's Pledge of Allegiance didn't really mean liberty and justice for all, and that this government by the people for the people was really more like government by the people who took the money from the people who paid the money. And it made me feel disillusioned. But if something you love is broken, you don't throw it away, you try and fix it. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be joining you today, because it's not every day that you find yourself in a position where you can really make a difference. And I'm not talking about me, some little immigrant political commentator. I'm talking about you, the Democrats abroad. Now, I'm not going to lie, if you're paying attention, it is very scary over here right now. America is in an existential crisis, and most people don't even know. They don't know that the democracy they take for granted is at the cliff's edge, and that we could walk away from this next, next election less free, less represented, less safe. The last president tried to stay in power illegally. And when that didn't work, he sent a mob of violent extremists ginned up on lies and propaganda to our capital to try and take power by force. Now, we all know they didn't succeed, but people died. And uh, sadly, our collective faith in the system and the peaceful transfer of power also died. To this day, the Republican Party has continued to use Donald Trump's lies to pass voter suppression laws across the country, including get, getting their new right-wing Supreme Court to hear a case this fall that would allow state lawmakers to upend all aspects of our elections so that, that there's no checks and balances. If the Republicans win this battle, elections across the country would be thrown to the whims of the most corrupt people in this nation. We're literally at a tipping point. Kira was just saying this, a place where one party in a two-party system is actively abandoning democracy for the rule of law to hold on to power. And they are using the power of lies and propaganda and the co-opting of Christianity and conspiracy theory to solidify minority rule. The Republicans understand that they no longer have the majority sentiment in this country, but instead of reaching out to new voters or expanding their message, they are doubling down on white grievance and Christian patriarchy, and they seem more than willing to turn this country we love into some sort of Hungarian-style dictatorship, sort of a, fasc a fascistic Christian nationalist nation. And you can already see our rights being stripped away from us, marginalized being groups being demonized, immigrants and asylum seekers who do not look like me being treated as less than human. America is in real danger and we can't ignore it whether we're at home or we're abroad. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. It really doesn't. I mean, an authoritarian America is a danger to everyone everywhere. How long do we think that the world order lasts if America abandons democracy and human rights? How long does the planet have if the party in charge of the country that could make the biggest difference doesn't believe in saving it? How safe are we if we give the nuclear codes back to the party that doesn't care that the last president stole top secret nuclear information? I mean, you've lived away from America for a while, so I can only imagine that your worldview has expanded past white Christian nationalism. I'm sure knowing many people around the world has made you less xenophobic, more accepting of diversity, and more open to people who might not look or think exactly like you. 
I'm sure your thoughts of book banning are belonging to some evil time in history and not the modern day USA. And I imagine you can see the importance of treating all citizens as equal and not making certain groups undeserving of rights. We can see what's going on in Iran right now. And unfortunately, stripping women of their rights is already happening in America and how we feel about it is on the ballot, which brings me back to why I'm so excited to be here. In 2020, Joe Biden won the popular vote by over 7 million votes, but the election itself really came down to tiny margins in a number of swing states. Biden won the state of Arizona, as we were saying, by just over 10,000 votes. He won Georgia by just over 11 and Wisconsin by just over 20. It works the same in state elections. Ron DeSantis only won the Florida governorship by 32,000 votes. Even local house races, which make a huge difference to how Congress works, can come down sometimes to hundreds of votes. Christy Smith lost California's 27th district in 2020 to a far right mega extremist who would go on to become a vocal insurrectionist and a leading voice in the anti-abortion movement by just over 300 votes. But she is back again and she is running against him this year which is where you come in, okay? So I know I'm near the end of today's event. So you already know that US citizens can vote from anywhere in the world. You know that there are six to 9 million voters abroad in any given year, but your rate of voting is incredibly low. Only 8% of voters that were eligible had their votes counted in 2020, only 2% in the last midterms, 2%. You heard those numbers I gave you for swing states. Some of them went one way or the other by less than 20,000 votes. Ron DeSantis only has the power to pass things like the don't say gay bill because of 30,000 people. A house seat can be made or broken by 100 votes. So I need you to understand that six to nine million people is a game changing number and you should be feeling your power. Look, we actually can't downplay the situation in America. These midterm elections literally decide if America sets itself on the path to becoming a Christian fascist nation where our votes no longer count and our rights are no longer ours and we are ruled by criminally compromised people like Donald Trump, or if we stay a democracy where the will of the people is respected and human rights are expected and the rule of law applies to everyone. And I know people are always saying, oh, every vote matters and this election is the most important, but it has never been more true. You need to go out and you need to tell people about this. I want you sitting at your beautiful tables wherever you are in the world and saying that you have the power to fix this, that you want to be proud of where you're from. And you might not live here, but you still care about it. Not only because you guys are the game changing number, but because you have the element of surprise. You are literally democracy's secret weapon. No one is expecting you to vote. 2% turnout in the last midterms? No one's looking for you. They think you don't care. But what you do in the next 45 days might just be the difference between America's success and America's defeat. And as someone who lives and works and is raising her child here, I can tell you, we need you. We need this election to go the right way. We can't fix everything that's broken in the midterms, but if we can hold the House and expand the Senate, if we can elect Democratic AGs and governors, if we can put secretaries of state and state legislatures who believe in democracy and power, then we live to fight another day. We'll be given two years to pass voter protections and codify women's rights and protect Social Security, which is now on the Republican chopping block. We'll be able to give this planet a fighting chance. So if you requested your ballot, if you talk to your friends and family about requesting their ballot, if you fill it out and you send it back in and you choose Democrats and democracy by the millions, this election won't know what hit it. No one is looking for you. No one is expecting anything from you. In fact, they are counting on you to sit this out, but you won't. You won't because you have the power to stop us from going over the cliff's edge. You have the power to be the heroes in this story. You can actually save us. And I hope that inspires you. I hope that fires you up. I hope you feel like that's thrilling because honestly, it is. I mean, how often do you get the chance to save your country? So from your original home to wherever you are now, thank you. I believe in you. And I can't wait to hear from you at the ballot box. Wow.
Thank you so much, Lee. <laughs> really, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us today and for getting us fired up to save oh. our country. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks we so got to do it. We do. We have to. All right. We are so lucky because now B Win is with us and we are going to switch over to her. B, the floor is yours. Well, thank you all so much for allowing me to share some time with you today. I'm B Win and I'm running for Secretary of State in Georgia. And all the things that Lee laid out are exactly why it is so incredibly important for you all to participate in this election cycle. So what I want to do is just share with you a little bit about what's going on in Georgia. I'm a state lawmaker. I've been in the General Assembly for the last five years. I am a member of uh, the committee that oversees our election laws. Every single year, I've seen bills introduced to make it harder for Georgians to vote, including attempts to eliminate Sunday voting and including attempts to roll back our voting hours. We've successfully able to beat those bills back through broad-based coalition building, but everything changed in 2020, and I think that you all know why. When we're looking at a state like Georgia, the ability for Georgians to come together in every part of our state to galvanize Georgians no matter race, gender, religion, political identity, we understood we had a task at hand, which was delivering a win for President Biden. We came together on the values of shared democracy, the values of equality and justice for all. And we knew that if we could galvanize our voters, we would have a pathway to victory. And Republicans also understood the same thing. So early on, before the results of the November election, Republicans started coordinating at a state and national level, and they started coordinating and sowing seeds of doubt around the validity of absentee ballot voting. In the state of Georgia, the laws around absentee ballot, no excuse, no ID, it was passed under a Republican legislature, and it was used in greater numbers, Republicans using it in greater numbers, than Democrats every single year up until 2020 when we were learning how to vote safely during a pandemic. So they started to question the validity of absentee ballot voting. So when we delivered in November of 2020, they would have a premise to try and overturn the results of the election. And that's exactly what they did. They sent Rudy Giuliani and Trump's legal team into my committee where they subjected us to eight hours of lies, misinformation and conspiracy theories. And when I discredited Trump's expert witness, they put my address on a right wing gun site and they called for my execution and they called me a traitor. They sent alternative electors into our state capitol, and one of those alternative electors is currently the lieutenant governor nominee on the Republican side. My colleagues behind closed doors, they told me they did not believe the election was stolen, and then they signed on to the federal lawsuit in Texas to try and overturn the results of the election in Georgia. Then I was naive thinking January 6th was going to be the precipice. We were witnessing for the first time in history a sitting president deny the peaceful transfer of power, resulting in a deadly and violent insurrection. I thought surely my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they were going to have some deep internal reflections on how their actions led up to this moment. But that is not what happened. Instead, that year, following January 6, we went into our state capitol, which was heavily armed the entire legislative session, and Republicans focused on passing Senate Bill 202, which was a two-page bill turned into a 98-page voter suppression bill. It restricts the use of those secure drop boxes that were widely used by both sides of the aisle, so popular that even the governor used them. It re reduced access to absentee ballot voting. It criminalizes handing out a bottle of water to a voter waiting in line. In a state like Georgia, in 2020, people waited up to 11 hours just to exercise their constitutional right and it blew the door open for mass voter challenges. In fact, Trump allies just came into our state and challenged the voting eligibility of over 37,000 Georgians in Gwinnett County alone with less than 50 days to election. Now, there is some conversation nationally and in Georgia where people are a little bit confused about my opponent, Brad Raffensperger. They believe that because he followed the law and chose not to find those extra 11,780 votes, that that makes him a hero. I believe that the bar for a sitting elected official should not that be that low. When I was elected, I took an oath to the office. I swore my allegiance to the country and the Constitution, and I knew that was the bare minimum of what was expected of me as an elected official. 
In the aftermath, he has fully embraced Senate Bill 202, and under his tenure, access to voting has become more restrictive, not expansive. He does not believe that every eligible voter should have access to the ballot box without barriers. He continues to roll Black Georgians off the voter rolls. He recently penned a letter to President Biden asking him to rescind an executive order that requires our state agencies to invest more in voter registration and voter education. And the question that we must ask ourselves is why would you not want your voters to be empowered with more information? I believe a democracy is made healthier when more people are able to participate and when more people are equipped with the information that empowers them to utilize their most powerful nonviolent tool which is the act of voting. Now, we know that there are so many issues on the line this election. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, Georgia implemented our six-week abortion ban, which was passed in 2019. And we also know in Georgia, we have one of the highest rates of mother mortality, with Black women dying at a faster rate than anybody else we have a governor who has refused to expand Medicaid, leaving over 600,000 Georgians without health insurance. We have 159 counties and over half of those counties do not have OBGYNs. Our rural hospitals are shuttering and we are slated to lose one of our only two level one trauma centers in Atlanta. It is dangerous for women to give birth in the state of Georgia and here we are, the Republican Party, including my opponent, who is staunchly anti-choice, forcing women to give birth and taking away bodily autonomy and inserting the government into the doctor's office where they do not need to go. We also know this. We know that under this ban, more black and brown women will die, more poor women will die. And we also know that Republicans have already started talking about implementing further bans. And there is a question of whether or not they would even protect essential things like right to contraceptions. In the state of Georgia, nearly 70% of Georgians support Medicaid expansion. Nearly 70% of Georgians oppose Roe v. Wade being overturned. Yet those are the laws of the land in the state of Georgia. And that is exactly why Republicans have gerrymandered our legislature. They have gerrymandered our congressional seats. And that is exactly why they want to make it harder for Georgians to vote, because they understand that the majority of people do not support their policies. They also understand that time is coming, and it is inevitable that we will continue to make gains in the state of Georgia because they do not represent our values, which is exactly why protecting the freedom to vote ensuring that every eligible Georgian has access to the ballot box without barriers is crucial to protecting our democracy. We have to recognize that it is simply not enough to have somebody who is going to count the votes, but we also have to think about having somebody who is going to ensure people can show up in the first place. Putting the thumb on the scale on the front end and changing the rules on the front end that is anti-democratic and it is equally dangerous to our democracy. I am from a state in which Congressman John Lewis was my congressman. And I think about him when he was 19 years old, crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, getting his skull bashed in and nearly dying for the fundamental right to vote. And he spent his entire life dedicated to this idea that our democracy is made stronger when people are able to exercise their freedom to vote. And I think about what it would be like if he were alive in this moment. He would be ringing the alarm bells and telling us here in 2022, we are having the same fight that he had when he was 19 years old. And he would be telling us that we should never cede our power. And when we don't show up to the ballot box, we are ceding our power. I believe in the principle of one person, one vote. This idea that no matter where you live, the color of your skin, your gender, your religion, how much money you make, what kind of job you have, when you get to that ballot box, your one vote counts just as much as anybody else's vote. That is real power. One person, one vote. That is the great equalizer. 
And that is exactly why they are trying to make it harder for Georgians to vote. So this is a all hands on deck moment. In a state like Georgia, we are, we are a battleground state. We know that in 2020, we were told we were going to lose and we ended up delivering a win. We know that in 2021, we were told we were gonna lose and we ended up delivering a win. We are told the same thing right now. But the reality is we know what happens when we organize and we remind people the importance of our voices. Now, we've got to send Reverend Warnock back to the Senate and our Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock, he says this, he said, a vote is a type of prayer. It is a kind of prayer. Our vote is an exercise of our faith. When we go to the ballot box, we are saying, we believe that nobody should die because they don't have access to health insurance. We are saying that when we go to our places of worship, the grocery store, the movie theater, our jobs, our schools, nobody should die of gun violence. We are saying that when a child is brought into this world, that we invest in that child from cradle to career, and that every child should have quality, quality and equitable public education. We are saying that the government needs to get out of the room of the doctor's office and that the choice belongs to women and it belongs to girls in our bodies. And we are saying that we believe our democracy is made stronger when more people can participate and we believe in protecting the freedom to vote. So I'm running for Secretary of State for those reasons and we need all hands on deck, including y'all, and that means making sure that not only you exercise your freedom to vote, but you remind everyone else the consequences of our election and what is on the line here for Georgians and Americans across our country. Because as we have seen and we have heard, we are in a constitutional crisis and come two, four years, we may not even have the ability to exercise our freedom to vote like we do today. And I'm BUN, I'm running for Secretary of State and we'll drop my information in the chat box. Thank you so much, y'all. We are so glad that you could join us. Thank you for squeezing us in and amongst your busy schedule. We know that you're um, out there on the ground and fighting to win that election. And we wish you the very best of luck. And thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, y'all. All right. And we are now gonna go over to Lucy Inman. She has also been able to hop on our call and we're so thankful that you could join us, Lucy. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so very much for fitting me in, and I hope you can hear me okay. Um, as you can see, I am on the road in North Carolina because I'm facing a statewide election for an open seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court. It's a big state, but you know what? It's impossible to gerrymander a whole state. Um, I am so grateful for all the support from Democrats abroad. We just heard how very important your right to vote is your right to get to the ballot box, your right to get, have your vote counted and have it count as much as every other vote. Um, those rights, women's reproductive health, rights including to marry the person you love are all being cast aside by the United States Supreme Court and pushed back to state Supreme Courts. Um, if you remember where you were when the Challenger crashed, if you remember where you were when John Lennon died, if you remember where you were when the towers came down, I bet you remember where you were on June 24th of this year. I remember where I was. I was at a seminar on the threat to independence of the judiciary by partisan politics. When we heard that the US Supreme Court had abandoned the president, president of Roe v. Wade and in a decision that Justice Kagan said was based on the currency of raw political power, rolled back a constitutional right. Our courts should be the one branch of government free of partisan politics. The courts are responsible for protecting the people's rights conferred not just by the state, by the United States Constitution, but by every state's constitution and by state common law. The North Carolina Supreme Court entered a landmark decision this year in February when it held that the North Carolina Constitution through our free election 
Nations Clause and Equal Protection Clause and others guarantees that every person's vote must count as much as every other person's so that partisan gerrymandering violates the North Carolina state constitution. Based on that ruling, the legislature's extremely gerrymandered districts were thrown out. They were sent back to the trial court and to a three judge panel that redrew these districts and brought us fairer districts in North Carolina for the first time in many years. I know this is happening all over the country, but I'll tell you the ink was not even dry on that decision before extreme partisans on the right We can simply overturn that decision from February that we don't like, and we can go back to gerrymandering just like we were before. I, if I sound wound up, I am wound up because our democracy is appreciate the support of everyone abroad. You are from so grateful, and boy, yes, take them by surprise. Show up with your absentee ballots. I cannot thank you enough. And Tim Warmoth, who is my favorite ambassador to Democrats abroad, thank you so very much for keeping in touch with everyone, even though you're back here in the States. Thank you so much, Lucy, for joining us today and safe travels and good luck on the road. And we're gonna do everything we can to get you elected. Jennifer, <clears throat> thank you very, very much for fitting me in. I greatly appreciate awesome. it. We appreciate you coming. And I'm going to hand you. over to our vice chair. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Inman. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer knows that I work pretty hard to, to find a personal connection to all of our speakers. So I'll just mention that Judge Inman is running to replace Justice Robin Hudson, who's married to one of my best friends from high school. And if I could step back to B. Nguyen, uh, I was working in a Vietnamese refugee camp when her parents uh, left Vietnam. And uh, at the time we wondered, people wondered, you know, would they fit in? Would they become good Americans and citizens? It's just so inspiring to hear her speak and know that uh, the people that we, uh, you know, sent to the United States from Southeast Asia at that time did more than fit in and have become great Americans. So it's good to have them. With that, I will uh, move to the, our next message. Uh, if I can find my little thingy. Um, as a New York voter for the last 35 years, I, I'm delighted to introduce our next message from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. She's been a good friend of Democrats abroad. She spoke at several of our annual meetings. And since being appointed to the Senate as a replacement for Hillary Clinton in 2009, Senator Gillibrand has been a leader in the fight for women's rights, highlighted by her defense of sexual assault victims in the military. She's been active on other key issues, such as negotiating the price of medicine for Medicare beneficiaries, which has now been become law under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Senator Gillibrand isn't up for election this year. Her colleague, Senator Schumer, is on the ballot, but she's been fighting to make sure that we have a Democratic Congress in 2023. Like California, I think like uh, Inga mentioned, like California, New York is a blue state, but there are several battleground congressional districts where votes from abroad can and will make the difference. As well as statewide races for Governor Kathy Hochul and you know the, the Attorney General Letitia James, who has certainly caught our attention in the last few days. And other races for those uh, in New York or, or from New York who are able to vote in state and local issues. In that regard, I should note that I just received my ballot by e email two days ago. So please check your mailbox to find your ballot. I also received printouts of the two envelopes that we have to use. And even more importantly, I received the instructions that explain how we have to put our ballots in the sort of what I call origami style envelopes. Ballots in New York have to be posted back. So act as soon as possible. And just one more comment on the connection for our international audience. Senator Gillibrand, before she entered politics, majored in Asian studies in college and spent a year in Beijing. So as a fellow Asian studies major, I know that Ta Jong Wen Shuo de Hanhao 
And with that, I turn it over to her clear and direct message from Senator Gillibrand about the importance of voting from abroad. Thank you very much, Teresa. Hello, everybody. I'm Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and I want to let you know that while you may be living overseas, you can still vote in our nation's state and national elections this November. You just need to go to votefromabroad.org and request your ballot today. There's so much at stake in our elections this year, from the right to bodily autonomy and privacy to whether Democrats or Republicans control the House and the Senate. And I know it can seem like your vote doesn't really matter all that much, especially when you're living overseas, but it actually does. In 2020, the overseas vote was the margin of victory for President Biden in Arizona and Georgia. So you can make an enormous impact. I know from my own campaigns, the Democrats abroad have always been there for me and have played crucial role in my path to victory. So I'm deeply grateful for your support. So again, go to votefromabroad.org and request your ballot as soon as possible. Together, we can maintain our majorities and ensure a better, more equitable future for ourselves and our democracy. Thank you. I think I'm turning it over to Camille, who's gonna introduce Congresswoman Nikema Williams. Thank you. Hello, so back to Georgia for a moment. Um, Chair of the Georgia Democratic Party, Congresswoman Nikema Williams has been a fierce advocate for social justice, women and families throughout her career and professional career, political and professional career, excuse me. As a member of Congress, Congresswoman Williams continues to uplift the legacy of her mentor and predecessor, Congressman John Lewis, by fighting to prevent voter suppression and expand free and fair access to the ballot box. Congresswoman Williams has a passion for a number of legislative issues, including voting rights, reproductive justice, social justice, economic justice, and health care. Her work addresses delivering on the promise of America for all. Join us as we listen to her special message to Democrats abroad. Hello, it's Congresswoman Nikema Williams, Chairwoman of the Democratic Party of Georgia. I am coming to you today to thank Democrats abroad for everything that you did in the 2020 election cycle in Georgia. Y'all were persistent in getting those ballots turned back in for the so many Georgians who vote in Georgia but live abroad. Y'all, we could not have made the historic gains that we made in the 2020 election by sending Georgia's 16 electoral college votes for Joe Biden to make him the next president of the United States without the support of Democrats abroad. And then, because y'all like to really show out, you made sure that you got those ballots back in to send not one but two Democratic senators to the U.S. Senate, with Senator John Ossoff and Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock joining our congressional delegation, giving Democrats the majority in the U.S. Senate. Y'all Democrats abroad make the margins in elections. I am grateful for everything that you continue to do to make sure that Democrats are represented all over the world and make sure that you are getting those ballots back in because y'all, we have to show the world that 2020 wasn't just a fluke. Let's do it again, y'all, and get those ballots back in. Thank you so much. I just cannot tell you how much I love that message. <laughs> she is, Nikima Williams is just such an inspiration to all of us. And I'm so thankful that she brought us back to Georgia. And that is where our state focused outreach for Democrats abroad began. And I'm just going to very quickly go through some voting things for Georgia and for Texas. And then we're going to hand it over and finish this off with um, our final message from Speaker Pelosi. Georgia is such an important election year. Please, please, please note that you're gonna get two ballots. Um, you're gonna have the, the full midterm ballot and a runoff ballot, and you can send both of those back together. Um, you 
have a look at our ballot return instructions. We've got really detailed step-by-step -step instructions that walk you through the process of voting both of these ballots that make sure that your voice will be heard because we have to send Senator Warnock back. We have to elect Stacey Abrams and wonderful statewide candidates such as Beanwin. And Texas is very similar. These are both postal mail states. You have to mail your ballots back. So get them back ASAP. And if you intend to return in either of these states, if that's what you've marked on your federal postcard application, you will get the full ballot. So if you receive a ballot, it's only federal elections, contact us and we can talk to you about that. We've got the most important elections ever in Texas. We have got to uh, elect Beto O'Rourke. We have this phenomenal statewide slate running alongside Luke Warford. We have Michelle Vallejo in Texas 15 in a toss up congressional district and we want to send her to Congress. So get your ballot requested if you haven't already, follow our ballot return instructions for Texas and make sure that you sign where you need to sign and we just cannot wait to see these people win. And one last reminder, for our, um, our prize draw, you know, as we near the end of this phenomenal ballot day, you know, be sure that you're helping to get out the overseas votes. And I want to give a big shout out to our great volunteers, both on camera and behind the scenes. And thank you again to our participants for taking time to listen in and getting excited to turn out the vote from abroad. You can watch the recording on Facebook. You can share it with as many people as possible. You can also get points for sharing um, vote from abroad and Democrats abroad so social media platforms. And just remember, we are an all volunteer organization and we need your help. We need you to get involved. And also we're a, volunteer, we're a completely uh, donation funded organization. So please pitch in 2020 to help us reach overseas voters. And with that, I am going to hand over to our chair, Candace. And thank you so much for coming to this event. I hope you walk away as excited as I am. And I'm gonna go print out my ballot and I'm gonna vote for Beto O'Rourke as soon as this is over. Over to you, Candace. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and once again, please plug in. Uh, I know after this, I'll share the link in just a moment, but we're jumping over to a battleground state phone banking party. would love to see you there. But before we do, uh, saving the best for last, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. Speaker Pelosi has represented California's 12th Congressional District, which encompasses the city of San Francisco since 1987. She previously served as Speaker of the U.S. House from 2007 to 2011, and again since 2019. Speaker Pelosi is the first woman elected Speaker and the first woman to lead a major political party in either Chamber of Commerce. In either Chamber of Congress. Speaker Pelosi has overseen two House impeachments of former President of the United States, and more recently, under the Biden-Harris administration, she's led the House in crafting and enacting the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, which again authorizes the largest investment in United States history to combat climate change. Speaker Pelosi has also been a fervent supporter of bodily autonomy and women's rights, and in fighting for us, she's never forgotten to add just a tad of humor. You might recognize her most recent tweet, uh, which says, there are those in the Republican party who think life begins at candlelight dinner the night before. We are so thrilled to have Speaker Pelosi speak to us today and add that little bit of humor and last push for these final 45 days. Hello, Democrats abroad, it's Nancy. Speaking for Democrats in Congress who are working tirelessly to defend our personal freedoms, bring costs down for working families, and protect our social safety net from Republican plans to dismantle Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act. Recent polling has shown that the race to hold and expand our majorities in the House and Senate is close to even. I think we're ahead with the momentum on our side since Roe was overturned. American citizens living abroad are often the margin of victory in our elections. When you vote, you make a difference. In 2018, when we took the House, our blue wave was tiny drops of water, very close races, and the margin of victory was from the military and overseas ballots. 
Your votes were key to securing Democratic victories to hold the House, flip the Senate, and elect President Joe Biden in 2020 as well. You are the margin of victory in key states, including Arizona and Georgia. Your military and overseas votes empowered Democrats to make progress in the lives of the American people, even with the slimmest congressional majorities in history. From the American Rescue Plan that saved lives and livelihoods, to the infrastructure law that is rebuilding our country with equity, to the Safer Communities Law that broke a 30-year stranglehold on gun violence legislation, and the Inflation Reduction Act that will save the planet and make a major difference in the lives of struggling seniors and working families with lower prescription drugs and health costs, and with the PACT Act uh, to provide health care to our veterans who may have been exposed to burn pits or bad water at Camp Lejeune. Help us to expand our majorities in the House and Senate so that we can keep delivering for the people on voting rights, codifying Roe v. Wade, LGBTQ rights, and gun violence prevention, to name a few of our highest priorities. If you're not among those who received their ballot today, it's not too late. Go to votefromabroad.org to order your ballot. You can even request that it be sent to you by email. Return your ballot as soon as possible. Don't wait another day. Your voice matters, your vote matters. Know your power and show your power with your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, and with that, we are at the end of our 2022 Ballot Day Rally. I wanna thank every single one of you for taking time out of your Saturday morning, afternoon, middle of the night to join us your commitment to making sure that we win this November, that we get every single US dual citizen voting, be at home or abroad, truly means a lot. And I can tell you when we wake up on November night, it's gonna mean a hell of a lot more. So from the bottom of my heart and from all of our volunteer teams, thank you for being here. I also wanna extend my deep gratitude to our state teams coordinator, Jennifer von Estorf, who was the ringleader uh, behind today's event and pulling together all of the speakers, all of the coordination. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much from all of us. Thank you. You can tune in uh, if you enjoyed today's event, please share it. It's on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Dems Abroad. Uh, you'll also see that shortly on our Twitter. Uh, Was I not speaking for any of that? Just no, that it was just <laughs> your, your your clumsy international vice chair who muted you just for a few seconds. Sorry. That's all right. I'm trying to unmute everyone so we could give you a, everyone a round of applause, but I failed miserably. Sorry, <laughs> my fault. Uh, well, seriously, thank you. Um, and as I said, every single person that you've seen on this call who was instrumental in making it happen. Um, from getting the speakers to advertising this, to helping run our queue, uh, to providing voter assistance in the breakout room. They are volunteers um, and we'd love to have you join our team. Uh, our work is really picking up right now. Uh, so please plug in, help us call those thousands of battleground state and swing congressional district voters. Again, we heard so many speakers talk about races being won by a handful of votes. These are those voters that can tip the scales. So what you do now to turn out the vote is going to make a difference. We have phone banking campaigns. I'm headed to the phone banking party to get on the phone myself. I'd love to see you there. Uh, calling Georgia voters, Arizona voters, Nevada voters, again, that are going to determine our, our majorities uh, in Washington and around the country. If you can, also would be so grateful for a donation. Uh, to support our programs, to support our infrastructure and our outreach programs that allow us to be the margin of victory. So democratsabroad.org slash donate. And one last thing, if you enjoyed today's event, there's more coming. This is one event of part of our De Delivering Democracy from Abroad series. Uh, so please tune in. We have another great event coming up on Monday sponsored by our Global Progressive Caucus uh, featuring progressive candidates coast to coast. So we're looking at, again, progressive candidates that have won their primary elections and are going up in very tight 
uh, races in the general election on November 8th, and they could use our support as well. So if you're around Monday, I believe 9.30 a.m. Eastern, we'd love to see you at that event uh, or at a future Delivering Democracy from a Broad series event. With that, let's go get our ballots back uh, and let's do everything we can in these next 45 days to win on November 8th. Thank you everyone for tuning in and for your support of Democrats Abroad. Let's go be the margin of victory. Let's go blue. Woo-hoo! <laughs>